and the last lecture of uh, Andrew Bernabin. So Pablo, floor is yours. I'll interrupt you with uh, questions as they come up and, and yeah, uh, all, all yours. Thanks. Okay, sounds very good. Okay, so hello everyone for the third day. So um, today, as you can see, my background is different. I'm not in Valencia. I'm actually in Castel de Fez, ICFO, near Barcelona. So I was having lunch a moment ago right there. So uh, it's good to see you all, you know, good to enjoy. It's fantastic weather in Spain. So I'm going to continue with um, you know, the subject of more quantum matter, which I gave uh, you know, the lecture yesterday and the day before yesterday. On the first day, if you remember, I spoke about, you know, it was an introduction to magic and graphene and the discovery of correlated insulated behaviors and superconductivity. And yesterday, we went a bit more in depth into some of the correlated behavior that uh, magic and graphene exhibits. Nematicity, uh, competing orders, you know, the, this cascade of phase transitions that we see in compressibility, and then strange metal behavior at the end. And today, I want to tell you about the next generation more quantum matter. You know, I call this more magic 3.0. Okay, so let's let's see where we go. So, just as a reminder, okay, more quantum matter is a new platform for strongly correlated physics and also for topological physics. Okay, traditionally we've counted with, you know, quantum materials, you know, atomic scale dimensions and ultra cold atoms in optical lattices with micro scale dimensions. These are two very versatile platforms to study correlated physics. And now we have a new one, more quantum matter, with a nice intermediate length scale between these other two platforms. Yeah? So using these more quantum, uh, quantum matter platforms, they have a number of you know, correlated and, and topological behaviors that have been observed. In fact, many of the phases of condensed matter physics have already been observed using very simple ingredients, okay? So we've seen, you know, correct insulators, superconductivity, various topological phases, magnetism, nematicity, more effort electricity, I forgot to include here strange metal, and many other things, yeah? Now, arguably, the phase that has attracted the most attention has been superconductivity, okay? So it's still sort of a little bit special within condensed matter physics, superconductivity. And in magic angle, twist the bilayer graphene, the bilayer case, okay? Robust superconductivity has been, you know, seen and reproduced by many groups. What do I mean by robust superconductivity? On one hand, the observation of zero resistance, okay? So when you cool down, you know, these are two different devices, magic and graphene, your resistance goes down, you know, linearly, this is strange pattern behavior. And then there is a superconductive transition and the superconductive, you know, resistance goes down to zero, okay? You have also flat voltage current characteristics with sharp switching, the critical current. That's another signature that this behavior, it's not just that the resistance goes down at zero bias, it's that you have a finite, you know, you can send a finite current bias through your sample and have zero voltage dissipation, okay? And then there is a sharp switching to a dissipative state. And perhaps, you know, as importantly, if not most importantly, is the observation of Josephson phase coherence, okay? So if you apply a particular magnetic field in a region of your device where you have, you know, superconducting islands coexisting with non-superconducting islands, you can observe Fraunhofer-like interference patterns of your critical current. So that demonstrates that there is Josephson phase coherence, and this is the last thing that truly 100% confirms that this is a robust two-dimensional superconductor. So I'm showing data from these papers here, but this robust superconductivity has been reproduced and extended by many, many groups nowadays. Now, this robust superconductivity is in contrast with signatures of you know, per, what is known as perhaps fragile superconductivity, and some people don't even know for sure if this is superconductivity or not in many other more systems, okay? So all of these systems, trilayer graphene aligned to HVM, Bilayer graphene twisted on top of bilayer graphene, twisted transition metal dichalcogenides, twisted monolayer graphene, bilayer graphene. All of these systems, people have reported observations which are consistent with superconductivity. For example, resistivity versus temperature curves, which go down at some point. They have this neat type behavior, and sometimes they even go to zero resistance. Okay. But, you know, 
however, there are key issues that make people doubtful whether these are truly superconductivity or not, or maybe there's this very fragile superconducting behavior. One is, for example, that the nonlinear voltage current characteristics, although they are nonlinear, they do not have sharp switching behavior. They're more you know, nonlinear like this, okay? And this is not necessarily you know, superconductivity, okay? And most importantly, there's no report of just some phase coherence from Hofer-like patterns in any of these systems. Okay, and the reproducibility in general has been very limited. You know, it's, it's not like you know magical ballet or thing where you can make you know ten samples and you know, it always shows superconductivity if you are within that magical range. These things have been you know sporadic reports and not very clear. So that led to a lot of people to ask the question: Okay, could it be that magic angle twisted by leg graphene is the only robust more superconductor? Okay, and as, as of a few months ago, we know that the answer is not. Okay, there is at least one other robust Morris superconductor, and that is mirror symmetric magic angle trilayer, twisted trilayer graphene, so MATTG, okay, instead of MATBG, okay, with a T here for trilayer. So this, this you know, was published a few months ago, uh, both the group of Philip Kim and my group in back to back papers on the same week in Science and Nature. We reported the discovery of a new. A more superconductor, magic angle twisted trilayer graphene. It's a much more tunable superconductor than the bilayer case, and to some extent, this is it's also quite a bit more interesting as you're going to see today. Okay, so with this introduction, this is what I'm going to tell you about today. I'll describe this system, magic angle twisted trilayer graphene. I'll show you that it's a robust superconductor, that it's highly tunable. It realizes ultra strong coupling superconductivity. And in a magnetic field, it exhibits a large power limit violation and we end some spoken activity and I will end with an outlook slide. All right, so let's get started. Pablo, yep. uh, before you get started, just a good question. Uh, are the twist angles 1.09 and 1.08 commensurate, commensurate or incommensurate? For those data that I showed earlier, um, I, I, I don't know if they're commensurate or incommensurate, but it doesn't really matter too much, okay? Um, people have shown that theoretically that for small twist angles like that, around 1.1 degrees, this difference between commensurability or incommensurability doesn't give much difference in terms of the physics. Thanks. On top of that, when I say 1.08, I mean 1.08 plus minus 0.01 or 0.02 degrees, depending on the degree of the southern of the sample. So we do not know if it is precisely commensurate or not. You know, we don't have any way to of knowing that ourselves in these transport measurements. Okay, so magic angle, you know, middle symmetric magic angle twisted trilayer graphene, or MATTG for short. Now that's a mouthful. Let me show you what do I mean by that. I mean this structure. Okay, it's three layers of graphene. If you take the bottom layer, okay, now you put a layer on top by rotating it by an angle minus theta, and then you put another layer on top by rotating it an angle plus theta with respect to the middle layer. That means that the bottom and the top layers are exactly aligned on top of each other, okay? Now, not only they're exactly aligned, in this structure which was proposed by Eslam Khalaf in Aspen Rishwana's group, group the bottom and the top layers are exactly all of the carbon atoms aligned, okay? So this is a configuration known as A twisted A stacking, okay? And as you can see, this has middle symmetry with respect to the middle plane. Now, you know, there has been a lot of related work on middle symmetric magic angle twisted trilayer graphene and related work on twisted trilayer graphene with other angles and orientations and multi-layer systems. And in fact, by now there are many, many papers on this subject, theoretical papers on the subject. Okay, so the electronic structure of magic angle twisted trilayer graphene is very interesting. Okay, if you take your three layers of graphene and you consider the interlayer tunneling T between each pair of you know, consecutive layers, okay, turns out your Hamiltonian, if you do a basis you know, transformation, it becomes block diagonal into two blocks, one block which is magic angle twisted by layer graphene like, but with an effective tunneling, which is square root of two times T. And then another block, which is 
just monolayer graphene, okay? So this is very interesting. If you remember from yesterday's, and from the first days, from Monday's lecture, and I also repeated it yesterday, okay? the magic angle condition has to do with this interlayer tunneling. So it turns out for magic angle trilayer graphene, the magic angle is the one for the bilayer case times square root of two, because of this is square root of two. Okay, so it's 1.1 times square root of two, so it's about 1.56 degrees. This decomposition block diagonal of this electron structure means that in the situation where you have this mirror symmetry, okay, your electronic structure. So by the way, sorry, I you know if you remember for magic angle bilayer graphene, the Moray wavelength was 13 nanometers. For the trilayer, because the twist angle is a little bit larger, the Moray wavelength is a little bit shorter. Okay, about that nine nanometers. But likely means that the interactions between your electrons are a little bit stronger. Now, in this mirror symmetric configuration, okay, this is the electronic structure for magic angle twisted triangle graphene for 1.57 degrees. And as you can see, we have a set of flat bands with remote bands, which looks very similar to magic angle twisted bilayer graphene, plus an additional massless direct dispersion, which comes from the monolayer graphene like part. Okay, this is when we have zero displacement field. So when all of these three layers, in addition to structurally being in a mirror symmetric configuration, electrically, they're also in a mirror symmetric configuration. Now, if we, you know, in our devices, okay, we have our magic angle twisted trilayer graphene in a whole bar geometry, source and drain contacts and whole voltage you know, RXX and RXY contacts. We also have a bottom and a top gate voltage or metallic plates with those two metallic electrodes, okay? We can apply symmetric or anti-symmetric voltages of those electrodes so that we can vary independently the density of charge carriers in the magic angle trilayer graphene and also independently the electric displacement field in the vertical direction so we can polarize carriers in our structure, okay? When you apply a finite electric displacement field, then you break the mirror symmetry. And as a result, you hybridize your flat band and your massless direct bands, okay? So at finite electric displacement field, you have a hybridization of this band structure. That's gonna give you additional tunability because we can tune the electronic structure where we're gonna be able to tune the properties of the system. So do we have evidence for the coexistence of that flat band and that massless direct bands? Indeed, we have. Okay, so if we measure, you know, Shudnikov, the has oscillations. Okay, so RXY, and I'm taking the derivative here of RXY with respect to magnetic field. I'll show simpler data in a moment. Okay, this is a bit complicated data, but it's just to show that we have that massless direct band. So if you measure RXY, you take the derivative with respect to magnetic field. So RXY as a function of density, filling factor, and as a function of magnetic field, and you take the derivative. Okay, you can see that we have a set of features. These vertical features occurring at each integer, those are the magic angle twisted by the graphene like part, okay, which exhibits those correlated insulators, analog, analogs of the correlated insulator features at each integer. And you can see right in on top, this thing, okay, this parabolic like looking thing, but which has ups and downs. What you're looking there is at the chemical potential of twisted bilayer graphene measured by the monolayer massless like Dirac band. If you remember, I showed you yesterday this chemical potential measurements where I had magic angle bilayer graphene and a separate graphene sensor, which was measuring the chemical potential. And there was this ups and downs indicating negative compressibility, et cetera. In this case, we have, this is like having the graphene sensor embedded in your flat band, right? Because you have this massless direct band coexisting with the flat band. So you're looking at the chemical potential of the magic angle bilayer graphene as read by the massless direct band part of the spectrum. Okay, so that's quite interesting. In fact, if we put our chemical potential here and we measure sigma xy, we have the half integer, you know, quantum hole, you know, tech characteristic of massless direct fermions. Okay, so that gives you evidence that we have indeed that massless direct band. If we apply a finite displacement field, 
So we get rid of that massless that comes through this hybridization. Then, you know, you see this band gets washed away. Okay, we no longer have it. Okay, so that shows you that indeed we have evidence of that mass data band. So we have this A twisted A type of structure. Oh, yeah. So let me show okay. you that we have. Uh, yep. Question. <laughs> um, so um, then you guys is uh, asking why the feature at nu equals minus one is missing. Yeah. This plot. As I as I mentioned yesterday, the feature at nu equals minus one is rarely seen in magic angle twisted ballet graphing devices at low temperature. The, we, we do see features at nucleus plus one, but at minus one, it's rarely seen. We do have a phase transition in compressibility, but in transport, somehow it doesn't usually manifest itself. In a, in a paper you know, that we published, um, I haven't told you anything about this uh, paper, but it's a nice paper that we published you know, both the group of Andrea Young and back to back in the same issue, issue of nature with us on a Pomerantchuk effect that happens at nucleus plus one and minus one. At finite temperature, you do see a feature, you know, that corresponds to correlations at nu equals minus one, okay? But that's at finite temperature. Lowest temperatures in transport, we don't see anything typically in RxX. You see a little bit of a feature in RxY sometimes, okay? But in RxX, but here actually I'm showing RxY, so, you know, it's, it's not there. You know, there's a weak thing in, in, in this, which is effectively compressibility, but it's rarely present. So that's consistent with what we'd expect from mm -hmm. bilayer graphene. There's a second question uh, by Mikel Garcia. Um, were uh, this, uh, these band features the motivation to study, I guess, uh, a trail layer system? And if not, what was the idea that led to study this uh, trail layer, twisted mm -hmm. trail layer? Very good. So there are many motivations. The perhaps the simplest, you know, is the fact that we wanted to see if this, you know, more superconductivity is just a singular, only happens once, magic angle bilayer graphene, and there's no other more system that exhibits robust superconductivity. It's, it's, you know, it's nicer if it's, you know, more, more if there are more robust, more superconductors. So we wanted to see if this was the case. And as you will see, this is the case. Okay, so that's one motivation. For me personally, the other motivation is that systems that have coexisting flat bands and massless direct bands are quite interesting. For example, some of you may know that a electronic structure, a type of lattice that exhibits coexistence of flat bands and direct massless direct bands is for example, the Kaome lattice, okay? And a lot of people think that that coexistence of flat and uh, massless bands can be a, a rich, you know, fertile ground for interesting correlated physics. Yeah? So I remember I was in a conference a few years ago and a Japanese theorist, Aoki, gave a talk in which he claimed that a secret to go towards very strong coupling superconductivity, very high TC superconductivity was to have coexistence of massless and massive you know, uh, bands, okay? So that was for me personally also motivation to investigate this system where there is coexistence. Now in the Kagome lattice, you know, the massless band, the flat band is typically very far away from the Fermi energy and on top, at the very top of the massless band. But here, as you can see, the massless and the flat band, you know, the direct point of the massless band is very close to the mm. charge neutrality of the flat band and both coexist and are very close to the Fermi energy. So in some sense, this realizes something that people look a lot for in, in Kagome lattices. So that, those um, were my personal motivations. Thanks. Uh, maybe just briefly, uh, maybe you're gonna mention this later on, but can you comment on band topology of uh, magic angle twisted, uh, I guess, okay. twisted tri layer <laughs> compared yeah, to yeah. Uh, twisted bilayer? So, the, so again, because the flat band is a magic angle twisted bilayer -like graphene like flat band, okay, this Hamiltonian, you know, is, literally the Hamiltonian of magic angle bilayer graphene, okay? That means that block is part of the Hamiltonian it means that all the topology and everything is exactly the same, okay? For, for that. Okay. So everything that you can think of for the bilayer case, at least at zero displacement field is similar for the trilayer case for the, for the flat band. Thanks. 
All right, so let me show you that we have a robust superconductor, okay? So again, what do we wanna see? We wanna see first zero resistance, and indeed, if you measure the resistivity of what you can trilayer graphene as function of temperature, you see this you know, drop to zero. You can fit this with the halperin neutron formula and extract a BKT, you know, Beresowski, costly thalamus transition temperature, which in this case is about 2.3 Kelvin. TC at 50% normal state resistance, which is very often quoted in these two-dimensional superconductors, it's about you know, 2.9 Kelvin. Yeah? Uh, you also want to see flat voltage current characteristics with sharp switching, and indeed, here you go, at base temperature, very flat, sharp switching. You can do this as a function of temperature and do a BKT analysis of the voltage current characteristics and extract, you know, same BKT temperature. Yeah? Now. You want to, you know, this is an electrically tunable superconductor also, okay? So this is the resistivity versus filling factor in the region around two holes per motor unit cell. So we have a big superconducting dome at minus two minus delta and a small one at minus two plus delta, similar to the bilayer case. If you go to the region of two electrons per motor unit cell, you have a big dome and a small one, okay? For extra electrons and holes with respect to this. So this looks, relatively similar to the way magic angle bilayer looks like. Then we wanna see the effect of a magnetic field. So first of all, we see a suppression of magnetic field. So for example, if you're at optimal doping where superconductivity is very robust, then you see that if you measure the differential resistance as a function of current bias, you know, the, the strength of this darkness is the, the black region tells you about the critical current. So the critical current goes down initially fast, you know, 100 millitesla scale, and then it has a long tail up to about half a Tesla, okay? And then if you, rather than being an optimal doping, you go to a region where you're near the edge of the superconducting dome, where again, your system breaks into superconducting and non-superconducting islands, then you can see characteristic oscillations, which are Fraunhofer-like oscillations of your critical current. Again, establishing that you have just some phase coherence, okay? So magic angle twisted trilogy turns out to be a robust superconductor. And by now, there are at least, I'm aware of at least three groups that have reproduced these results. Okay, so let me show you there is a much more highly tunable system than the bilayer case. So, because now we have these two knobs, the density of charge carriers, which we also had in the bilayer case, but now the electric displacement field, which didn't do too much for the bilayer case, then we can plot our resistivity as a function of those two factors, okay? Filling factor or density, again, from minus four to plus four, we're going from four holes per more unit cell to four electrons per more unit cell, and then the displacement field, okay? And as you can see, this is the resistivity, and this is quite a complex phase there, okay? So let me guide you. Superconductivity is the light blue region, so zero resistance, okay? Resistive features, highly resistive features are in yellow. Okay, so now you can think of this diagram and immediately, you know, you can look at this diagram and immediately notice a certain degree of symmetry. Okay, first of all, there's symmetry between the top and the bottom part of this diagram. Okay, so you can see you're supposed to be here, here, there's a branch here, there's a branch here. Okay, similarly here, even this thing, you know, gets repeated here and so on. Okay, also these features get repeated, okay, bottom and top. So that tells you that the bottom twist angle and the top twist angle, you know, between layers one and two and between layers two and three, it's, you know, very similar, okay, or you know, probably you know, almost identical because otherwise you would see a symmetry, you know, when you polarize your carriers with your displacement field. Now, the other thing that you can see it is that, okay, now it becomes something of this half, you know, half full, half empty glass of water. You can think of left and right as having a lot of symmetry, or you can focus on the asymmetry, okay? There is certainly some symmetry. For example, you can see the superconductivity that occurs mostly between filling factors minus two and minus three, and between two and three, okay? And we have also some branches which cross into minus one, minus two, and also here into one and two. So that's some degree of symmetry at the same time, you can see that some of the resistive features that appear here, they do not appear certainly with the same intensity on the left side, 
Okay, so there is some asymmetry between electrons and holes. And if you remember, in magic angle twisted bilayer, you can think there was also a certain degree of asymmetry between electrons and holes with respect to charge and neutrality. Okay, so that's sort of reminiscent. Now, what we can do is we can try to measure some other property of the system, okay, and see if we can find correlations between that property and the features that we see here in the resistivity phase diagram. Okay? So the quantity that we decided to look at was the normalized hole density. Okay, so the hole density in H, which you get through uh, measurements of your hole voltage. Okay, so a finite magnetic field. That's telling you essentially. Uh, what is the density of, of free carriers available to conduct, okay? So if you multiply by four, remember by four because of spin, valley, and then divide by the number of electrons per mole unit cell, okay? This is the equivalent of the filling factor, but for the free carrier density available for transport, okay? So we can measure that quantity, the normalized hole density as a function again of filling factor and displacement field. And you see that we have again a relatively relatively complex phase diagram. Okay? Now, to see this order, all of the features, you know, most of the features in this diagram can be assigned to one of the following three situations. Okay, you know, there are details that vary, etc. but to see this order, that's the case. So first thing that we can assign these features are you know, some features correspond to a gradual change in sign of the normalized hole density, okay? Normalized hole density goes from negative to through zero smoothly to positive. That's a behavior that corresponds to gap or direct points, okay? Why? Because, you know, at a, you know, when you reach a gap or when you reach a direct point, your density of free carriers is zero. So your, your hole density goes through zero smoothly, okay? That happens here, for example, at charge neutrality. You see, you go from dark blue to light blue, white, light red, darker red, okay? So it happens at charge neutrality. Now, another feature that you can have, we call them resets of the normalized hole density, okay? These correspond to those phase transitions, okay? Remember the cascade of phase transitions? So you have a reset of your you know, normalized hole density when you flavor polarize and your carriers go back you know, to charge neutrality. Okay, so that can happen, you know, in, in red or in blue. Let me show you here an example in blue. You go from light blue to dark blue, then a reset to white to zero, and then you go light blue, darker blue. Okay, so it's a reset type of behavior. It happens there and it happens in other places. And finally, you can have a feature which corresponds to a Fonhoff singularity. At a Fonhoff singularity, your RXY goes smoothly through zero, which means your whole density, which goes as one over R X Y, diverges and changes sign. Okay? So you can have, you know, something like you know, light blue, dark blue, then abruptly change to dark red, and then to light red. Okay? And that's something that, for example, you can see here. You go from light blue to dark blue, then you switch abruptly to dark red, and then to light red. Okay? So there's a function of singularity there at that point. There's another one here and there are fungal singularities in various places. Yeah? Okay, so now that we have these two phase diagrams, let's compare them. And in particular, paying attention to the superconducting regions boundaries, okay? So we can go and look in this phase diagram. We, I'm going to superimpose them, but superimpose them schematically because otherwise it would be a little bit messy. So this is the resistivity phase diagram, you know, the superconducting phase boundary phase diagram, okay? Dark blue means very strong superconductivity, light blue means weak superconductivity, but still present. And now I'm going to superimpose the boundaries, uh, you know, the, 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 the situations that we found in the normalized hole density, okay? So these red lines correspond to gap Dirac type of behavior, for example, a charge neutrality, if you remember. These Orange lines correspond to reset type of behavior. And these blue lines correspond to Fanghoff singularity type of behavior. And as you can see, now a clear pattern emerges, okay? At zero displacement field, superconductivity occurs mostly between filling factors two and three 
and minus two, minus three, okay? And it's bounded by resets. At high displacement field, however, superconductivity is bounded by von Hof singularities, okay? Now, this is something which is quite peculiar, okay? So let's examine it a bit more closely. So let me look at these data now, but look at the real data. I'm going to look at you know, the resistivity across this line, that same line which crosses a von Hof singularity there, okay? So if I look at the resistivity, okay? So the system is in the superconducting state and then close to nu equals minus three gets out of the superconducting state, okay? Right there, goes out of the superconducting state, yeah? If I measure along the same line, the critical temperature, the VKT critical temperature, okay? You see that it's finite, of course, in the superconducting state. And of course, decreases until it becomes zero the moment the system stops being superconducting. That makes sense, okay? Now, I can measure along the same line, the effective mass of the carriers by looking at the temperature dependence of the schudikoff the Haas oscillations, okay? And that gives you, you can fit then the effective mass. And what we find is that effective mass increases, 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 and it reaches a maximum and then it decreases, okay? The position of this maximum coincides with the Van Hoff singularity here, Okay, which is something that you, know, you expect, you know, close to Van Hoff singularity, your effective mass diverges. Okay, and in fact, what you can see is that the Van Hoff singularity, which coincides with the maximum your effective mass, actually corresponds to the boundary of your superconducting phase. Yeah? Now, this is very much unlike weak coupling BCS type superconductivity, where your critical temperature increases exponentially with density of states, with increasing density of states, okay? So in a regular BCS type superconductor, you expect that an increase in the density of states would lead to an exponential increase in TC. Here, not only it doesn't increase, it actually decreases. And at the maximum, when we would expect the TC to be the maximum, it actually is zero. And from there on, is zero, okay? So this is something which is quite peculiar. Now, I should mention that um, this fact that TC occurs at a, you know, TC is maximum away from maximum density of states, okay? It's something that we had already seen in magic angle twisted by layer graphene in our combined transport and compressibility measurements. So remember the compressibility, you can think of it as the inverse compressibility as the inverse density of states. So you can see here, you know, this is in the supplementary material of our paper, you know, between filling factor minus two and minus three, there is this bump in inverse compressibility, meaning the density of states is minimum here, but that corresponds in transport to the maximum TC. So the maximum TC is at the minimum in the density of states of the system, okay? So these results are consistent in trial of the thing with the ones that we found for the bilayer case. Okay, so this is clearly not weak coupling VCS type superconductivity. Okay, let me tell you about the coupling strength of the system. So we can measure TDKT versus filling factor and displacement fill. Okay, again, the system is highly tunable. So if you spend enough time, <laughs> you can measure a lot of things. So this is TDKT versus, uh, sorry, once, yeah. Uh, it might, yeah. So versus displacement field and filling factor. Let me project it here onto a plane. And now this is quite complex. So I'm gonna show you cuts, okay? I'm gonna show you a cut of TBKT versus filling factor at optimal displacement field. And then a cut of TBKT versus displacement field at optimal doping, okay? So this is TBKT in the region around two holes per more unit cell as a function of filling factor for at optimal displacement field, okay? As you can see, there is a very small superconducting dome for electron doping uh, around two holes per more unit cell and a much bigger dome for extra holes with respect to two holes per more unit cell, okay? Now, along the same axis, I can measure also the Ginzburg-Landau superconducting coherence length 
by doing measurements on in a magnetic field, in a perpendicular magnetic field. Okay. And as you can see, the superconducting clearance length, you know, is non-monotonic, you know, it has a minimum near optimal doping. Okay. And this superconducting clearance length, if you look at this axis, it's actually extremely short. Okay. Now it's very short because remember, this is a very dilute superconductor. Okay. It's in fact the lowest density two-dimensional superconductor that exists by far, okay? But you can do bilayer and trilayer. In fact, if I show you here what's the average interparticle you know, distance for the system, you can see that the ginsburg now superconductor coherence length in this underdope region and optimal doping is very much you know, bounded by this interparticle distance, okay? We can do the same thing at optimal density as a function of displacement field, okay? We can also look at the superconducting coherence length. This is the average interparticle distance at optimal density, and you can see the same thing, okay? Now, the superconducting coherence length in the weak coupling regime, it's giving you the size of your Cooper pairs. It can be interpreted as the size of your Cooper pairs, okay? In a stronger coupling regime as we are here, it's a bound for the size of your Cooper pairs. Okay, so this means that at optimal doping, the Cooper pair size is of the same order or smaller than the average interparticle distance. Okay, so that is again a situation which is very unusual. Okay, and it reminds us of this type of diagrams, you know, that people typically are more typical of the cold atoms community where they can tune these things. Okay, so this is a plot taken from Mohit Randeria's. Uh, review in the BC to BC crossover, but in cold atom systems, they have, you know, they can tune the scattering lengths so that they can go all the way from deep in the VCS limit, where the average in the Cooper pair size is much, much bigger than the average interparticle distance. And they can go all the way to the extreme BC limit where your, you know, molecular pairs, you know, your bosons, have a much smaller size than the average interparticle distance. And the in between, when those two length scales are similar, corresponds to the VCS to BEC crossover. Okay. Now, in three dimensions, there is a bound on the value of your critical temperature over your Fermi temperature, which is 0.22. In two dimensions, there is a corresponding bound on TBKT over TF, which is 0.125. And it is reached precisely at that BCS to BEC crossover. Okay. Now, because uh, we can, uh, yep. How, uh, how do I see the effective mass there? I can ask this question. So, Oscar Rafek uh, actually has a question uh, Is this, uh, is this Sunnika that has mass of the flat band, or uh, can you isolate the mass of the direct leg band? Yeah, this is the, this is the, so in the Kafka gas oscillations, we're measuring the effective mass of the flat in the flat band. Yeah. The, you know, the values that we get are, you know, the, the, the density of states of the massless band is very uh, small. We have very few charge carriers there. Of course, they're highly mobile because they're a flat band. But in order to check this, what we can do is we can apply a displacement field so that we hybridize and we get rid of the, you know, uh, massless component of the, of the electronic structure. And then we can see a sort of continuity of, you know, we can see that we're measuring our effective mass values. You will see them in the next slide, which correspond to heavy you know, electrons. Okay. Um... Okay. So, so, you know, the Fermi temperature is given by this expression. And we know the density of carriers, we can measure the effective mass. Okay, which is here as a function of filling factor at a certain displacement field. So we can extract this TBKT, which we also measured, I just showed you before, over TF. And these are you know, the curves as a function of displacement field. We can do the same thing, sorry, as a function of filling factor, we can do the exact same thing as a function of displacement field. Okay, and we can measure TBKT over TF as a function of displacement field. And as you, know, you can see, this actually corresponds to 0.125. So, you know, TBKT over T reaches values well in excess of 0.1 with the maximum you know, coinciding within error bars to about 
Yeah, this is them. So I showed this, you know, Uemura plot uh, on the first day, you know, this tells you, you know, it's in, in long loss scale, PC versus Fermi temperature. Uh, this is the line, you know, T will Fermi temperature. This is T equal TBC, you know, that 0.22 bound for three dimensional systems. This is the T equals TBKT for that 0.125 you know, bound in two dimensional systems, okay? As I mentioned the other day, conventional superconductors tend to be around here. In this purple band, we have, you know, pretty much all the unconventional superconductors. Magic angle twisted by laser graphene, depending on whether you take TBKT here or TC 50% here, okay? Which one could you know, correspond to, to these two lines, you have these data points here, twisted, Trilayer graphene, magic angle twisted trilayer graphene, the corresponding data points for TBKT and 50% are here. Okay. So this is the strongest coupled superconductor in the world. Okay. If the cuprates had the same coupling strength the magic angle twisted trilayer graphene has, they would be well above room temperature superconductors. Okay. Now I should mention that recent work also by Jose Wasser's group has found another superconductor that also reaches this line. Okay, it's which was recently published in science. Okay, so now where does superconductivity emerge from in magic angle to trilayer graphene? Okay, so we have a bit more information here that, that, that than we had in the bilayer case because of the displacement field tunability. So as you can see in this diagram, okay, at low displacement fields, superconductivity is bounded by resets. Okay? At large displacement field, we have Fanhoff singularities plus gap Dirac behavior. Okay? So then that tells us the following. Okay? So by analyzing this displacement field dependence, okay, what we have realized is that superconductivity emerges upon doping filling factor two phase, okay, which has a broken flavor symmetry in you know, ground state with two Fermi surfaces. What do I mean by that? Okay. So we can look at small displacement field and then as a function of magnetic field, measure the resistivity. And we look at the Shunikov that has oscillations and Landau fan diagrams, okay? And as you can see, both for electrons here and for holes, all of these fan diagrams, you know, you see churning insulator states and all the topology and everything. So all of the diagrams and you know, states, all of the Shunikov oscillations point outwards, okay? They all point away from charge neutrality, okay? Charge neutrality is here in the center. So on the right, all the lines go towards the right. On the left, all the lines go towards the left, okay? Now, if we go to high displacement field, however, then we see that the Shunikov has oscillations have some diagrams, you know, fan diagrams pointing towards the, away from charge neutrality, but you have others pointing towards charge neutrality, okay? Now, if you point to away from charge neutrality, okay, for electrons, this means extra electrons, for holes, it means extra holes. But if you point towards charge neutrality, on the positive filling factor side, it means you're having here hole-like Fermi surfaces, and here electron-like Fermi surfaces. So what, you know, the most important key thing, you know, that gave us information about this was in this region, okay, close to filling factor two, so this region two minus delta, when we saw the Sunnik of the has oscillations pointing towards charge neutrality, indicating that this is a hole Fermi surface. So, this is corresponding to this region where we see superconductivity, okay? So what this is telling us, it's, it's telling us the following. At small displacement field, okay, we have this cascade of phase transitions, okay? So you have resets, you know, at each integer that's bounding your superconductivity between two and three and minus two and minus three, okay? In this region, we know that we have a phase transition. We just underwent a phase transition to a flavor polarized state with two open Fermi surfaces. Two are fully polarized and two are sort of empty, okay? As we increase the displacement field, we see that there is a Fanhoff singularity, 
okay, that seems to kick in the phase transition before nu equals two, okay, and before nu equals minus two. Okay, now because it's kicking the phase transition to a flavor polarized phase with two Fermi surfaces, but it's doing it before nu equals two. It means those two Fermi surfaces have to be whole doped, okay? Because you have, you know, two electrons per mole unit cell in the flavor polarized phase. And therefore the Fermi surfaces, which are still open, they must be whole doped because this occurs before nu equals two, okay? So these region of superconductivity had to be whole like, and indeed, in our Shunikovic has oscillations, we see that those carriers are whole like. Okay, so this gave us the clue to the fact that the important thing for the superconductivity, the superconductivity emerges in the system. Okay, as you dope. Okay, either with electrons or with holes, the many body ground state, which has two open Fermi surfaces. Okay? So, in this region, that's you know, that's what gave us the clue. We didn't have this kind of thing with the biology case, okay? Now, it is natural to assume, although it's not obvious, okay? That for magic angle twisted bilayer of thing, where the superconductivity also occurs most strongly between two and three and between minus two and minus three, that this is also the case, okay? But it's, you know, it's not obvious. We don't have that direct evidence like here. Okay, in the last um, 10 minutes or so, let me tell you about uh, the properties of the system in a parallel magnetic field. So if we apply a perpendicular magnetic field to magic angle to trilateral thing at optimal doping, you know, applying a perpendicular magnetic field introduces, you know, vortices, this orbital effect, which kills superconductivity well below one Tesla, okay? Now, because the system is a two-dimensional superconductor, okay, if we try to apply a magnetic field parallel to the trilayer plane, okay? And we try to induce the same type of, you know, vortices, you know, like one flux quantum per, you know, more unit cell in the lateral dimension, that would take hundreds of Tesla, okay? So this means these two dimensional superconductors are very good to look at what is the effect of effectively a Zeeman field in the systems, okay, on the superconductivity. Now, as a reminder, okay, you know, conventional spin singlet, you know, BCS superconductors. So the Cooper pairs are spin singlets, you know, up, down, minus, down, up, okay? The binding energy is given by the gap, the superconducting gap, which happens to be 1.76 kV times your critical temperature. A Zeeman effect you know, splits apart your Cooper pairs, okay? So when the Zeeman energy, UMVV, is equal to your gap, Okay, then your superconductivity should be long gone. Okay? That leads to something which is known as the Pauli limit, paramagnetic limit, or the chandra sahar clockstone limit, okay? Which tells you the superconductivity, the critical field for a Zeeman field should be about 1.86 times Tesla per Kelvin times TC in Kelvin, okay? So for a TC of one Kelvin, you expect superconductivity to be gone by you know, 1.86 Tesla. Okay, and that again is for VCS spin singlet superconductors. So, you know, we can take our devices, which before we were measuring them in a perpendicular magnetic field configuration, we warm them up, rotate the sample, so that now we're applying a parallel magnetic field. We measure them again at zero field, you know, phase diagram very similar to what I showed before. Particular TC is about 2.7 Kelvin here at optimal displacement field and density. That means that superconductivity should be long gone by the time we reach five Tesla parallel magnetic field. Okay, so we measure this exact same data at a parallel magnetic field of 10 Tesla. And to our surprise, we have an extended region where superconductivity survives, okay? At fields well above the Pauli limit. Now we can look at this more carefully, okay? So in particular, we can look at the voltage current characteristics, just to make sure that indeed, as we increase the magnetic field, we still have a finite, you know, non -dissip you know, zero dissipation region. And we have here this zoom in for, you know, seven, eight, nine, 10, seven, eight, nine, 10 Tesla, still flat voltage current characteristic, indeed it survives. We can look at the 
you know, a zoom in of the resistivity versus filling factor and displacement field at 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 Tesla. Indeed, there's an extended region. We can watch it shrink, okay? We can now do, you know, in order to see by how much we violate the power limit, we need to do temperature dependent measurements, okay? So we can measure here at optimal displacement field as a function of filling factor or density. So this is the usual superconducting dome, okay? And now we can measure the superconducting dome as a function of parallel magnetic field. And we see that at 10 Tesla, there's still a finite superconducting dome, okay? So now what we can do to do this continuously is we can pick a particular density, okay? And do temperature dependence and parallel magnetic field dependence continuously, okay? Here, dark blue means below, you know, essentially it's like TVKT or less, okay? So dark blue means zero resistance, okay? We can see this profile. So we can take any threshold that we want for, you know, TC, you know, 10% of the normal state resistance, 20%, 30%, we can take TVKT 50%, they all get the same result, okay? We can see that these contours, these contours follow a parabolic, you know, this will a parabolic expression. So we can actually extract what are the Pauli limits, you know, at zero temperature. And as you can see, superconductivity survives to much, much higher values than the Pauli limit. In fact, the Pauli violation ratio at this particular filling factor is in excess of a factor of three, okay? Now, there are, you know, a number of superconductors that violate the Pauli limit, okay? And there are a number of mechanisms that allow violating this Pauli limit. For example, one of the, you know, one of those that is, is, has been observed in a number of systems is systems which have very strong spin orbit coupling, such as niobium selenide, which is also a two-dimensional superconductor. You know, the monolayer case, it has been reported, you know, Pauli violation limits, you know, of the order of four, the extrapolation is of order you know, six or so at low temperatures, okay? So this transition method at calcogenides, they violate the Pauli limit, but these systems are well known to have a very strong spin of coupling. okay? There's this icing superconductivity in the systems. However, the thing has a very small spin of coupling of the order of 40 microvolts. So it's very unlikely unless for some reason that we haven't found any theories, you know, that was able to tell us a good reason for this, but unless spinary coupling is enhanced by almost two orders of magnitude, imagine angle twisted trilegraphine, it would be very unusual that spinary coupling would be responsible for the observation of our data. Now, there is also something called FFLO states, finite momentum pairing, okay? That can give you also a violation of the Pauli limit, but it's a maximum violation of the order of 30%, 30-40%, and only at low temperatures, you know, below half of TC. However, in our case, you know, we don't see 40% violation, we see a 300% violation, and it's always present right away you know, at TC, okay? It's not that start to violate, you know, at low temperatures, it's always violating by a large factor, okay? So that's why we think that FFLO physics is probably not responsible, again, for, for our data. Now, you can also have, you know, preformed pairs, you know, which can manifest themselves as a pseudo gap that can happen in the strong coupling regime. Remember, because in our system, we're, you know, close to the VEC to VCS crossover. You know, it could be that we have, a, you know, gap values which are much, much larger than what the KBTC formula would give you the VCS formula, okay? So in our case, in the region where we're in the strong coupling limit, that's likely the case. However, we also observe a large poly violation limit, okay, away from the strong coupling limit, you know, in regions where our 3KT over TF is very small. So we're in a weak coupling limit, okay, which we can tune electrically. The polyvisualization limit is always about two, you know, kind of 2.5 and up to 3 point something, okay? So we think again that although, you know, a large pseudo gap, okay, preformed pairs 
might be an explanation for it. It's unlikely to explain our data because of the you know, pervasiveness of the observation of the power violation image. Now, moreover, none of those mechanisms can explain what I'm going to show you now, which is the following. Okay? So I have been showing you data at optimal displacement field and optimal density. Okay? However, if we look at this parallel magnetic field behavior at less than optimal displacement field in this region here, okay, we see the following. Okay? I'm zooming now in the high magnetic field region. So this axis starts at five Tesla. Okay? So you can imagine this goes down like that parabolically kind of down to zero magnetic field. What we see is that TBKT, this, this light blue region tells you where zero resistance is. So you know, TBKT here goes down with parallel magnetic field, reaches sort of zero, and then starts to increase again at finite magnet, at higher magnetic field. Okay? This is called re-entrant superconductivity. It cannot be explained by any of the other mechanisms, to the best of my knowledge, that I mentioned. Okay? We can see that there is this superconducting one and superconducting two regions, phases, okay? as a function of magnetic field. This can be seen not only in, at the level of TBKT, but if you also measure the critical currents of the differential resistance versus current bias, you can also see that the critical current decreases and then decreases again, okay? And you have these one and two regions, yeah? Now, there are a few superconductors which exhibit reentrant superconductivity above the Pauli limit. The most famous are the family of uranium. You know, these are radioactive superconductors, literally. So it's a family of uranium you know, superconductors. You know, uranium germanium to uranium rhodium germanium, uranium cobalt germanium. Okay. They exhibit superconductivity above the Pauli limit. And you know, most pronounced in this case, you know, with big reentrant and high field. Lately, you know, the, the latest you know, member of the family is uranium ditelluride which exhibits a super high field reentrant phase, okay? And superconductivity. Here it violates power limit, and here it exhibits a field polarized phase at high field. These superconductors are either ferromagnetic superconductors, or in the case of uranium T2, is at the critical point here, where it's a spin triplet, you know, nearly ferromagnetic, but not actually ferromagnetic superconductor, okay? And they see this, you know, transition to a field polarized Phase at high field. We also see you know, these transitions at a certain magnetic field, okay, that separates superconducting one and superconducting two regions. Okay. We sometimes see even maybe some signs of maybe other phases, but here resistivity doesn't go precisely to zero. So we don't know if those are really true phases. Okay. So magic angle twisted trilayer graphene is very likely not a spin singlet superconductor. Okay. This high field phase. Is probably spin triplet, and the low field phase might be a linear combination, you know, of spin singlet and spin triplet, you know, spin valley log type superconductivity. So triplet components in addition to singlet components, perhaps could also be triplet, although there's some theoretical reasons why the low field phase at zero field is unlikely to be just purely spin triplet. Okay. Now, with this, I want to end. So I have shown you that you know we have now another you know robust more superconductor beyond magic angle twisted by layer graphene. It's a system with exceptional exceptional tunability, magic angle twisted trilayer graphene. It's a non-trivial interplay with form of singularities which seem to trigger phase transitions. We can rearise the ultra strong coupling regime. Okay? There's large power limit violation and we enter superconductivity, which means that magic angle twisted trilayer graphene is very likely not a spin singlet superconductor. Okay, you can look at the details of all of this in these two papers. Now, in terms of outlook, well, we had it, we have it for bilayer, we have it for trilayer with this alternating twist geometry proposed by the Wiesmannet group. Who knows? Maybe, you know, we have a recipe, you know, in this paper, they have a recipe for how to make this alternating switch layers, the four layers, five layers, etc. So I hope that, you know, Either ourselves or, or one of our friendly competitors, you know, one day will tell you about more magic 4.0, 5.0, who knows? Okay. It's an important question. What is the role of C2Z T 
symmetry. Okay, this is C, C to Z is 180 rota degree rotation around an axis perpendicular to the planes, and T is time reversal symmetry. Magic angle twisted by and mirror symmetric magic angle twisted trilayer graphene exhibit C to T symmetry. This, you know, and this one group has argued that that's a key symmetry which is essential and may be responsible for why these two exhibit robust superconductivity, whereas other more systems superconductivity seems to be, you know, at best very fragile, you know, much weaker. Now, we do not know yet what's the spatial symmetry of the ordered parameter, okay? This paper here, this PNAS papers, and I think several others have classified all of the possible symmetries that you could have, you know, or the parameters you could have depending on the symmetry of the system. So it would be very interesting, of course, to if we could obtain information about this. And can we find novel correlated topological phases, you know, for example, zero field or low field fractional churn insulator, fractional churn insulated states? Okay. So Actually, um, together with our collaborators, I'm going to copy this paper. Did we post it already? We may have posted it already, I forgot, um, in the archive. Uh, we have demonstrated actually very, you know, relatively low field fractional change layer states already in this system. Okay, in the, it's actually in the bilayer case, not in the trilayer case, okay? So a lot of, you know, rich physics, you know, is, is, is happening in, in these water systems. And I encourage you all to, you know, both experimentalists and theorists to, to work on this, you know, it's a, it's a very rich field. So once more, you know, my slide acknowledgement with, you know, my, my group members, you know, my extended, you know, my, my group collaborators, and funding agencies. And again, thank you very much for your invitation and, and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, thank you for all three lectures. They were really, really, really nice, uh, very clear. Uh, I think, I believe, Oscar has a question, uh, so you can unmute yourself. If I have a beautiful talk, I have a question. Oscar, thank you. Um, I have a question about uh, the trilayer, the, the twisted trilayer. So mm -hmm. imagine, imagine we are at uh, new equal to two, and we go mm -hmm. to um, larger displacement field where you start seeing the Landau fans pointing towards the charge neutrality point. Mm -hmm. Now imagine we were to measure the Shubnikov de Haas mass for those um, new uh, Landau fans and then track yeah. it as you decrease the displacement field. Yes. Will that mass, will that mass go up? Hmm? Very good question. So the Shubnikov de Haas oscillations that we measured there, as you probably saw and you've seen in the paper, they are weak, okay? So we weren't able to measure the effective mass for that branch, okay? as a function of displacement field, which is indeed something that would have been nice to do, you know, to see if it increases or decreases, you know. So we have it for some of the other regions, but which do not correspond to that, you know, the, 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 the two, you know, minus two plus delta or two minus delta, okay? So we don't have that information, but I agree with you. And I, you know, I'm of course aware of your paper. It would be nice you know, the, to tell us if that those are light or heavy, you know, type of carriers, you know. And as we get better devices, this is something that I keep in mind to do those measurements, you know, motivated by your work. Thank you very much. Uh, I see, Reyes, do you have a question or? I, 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 hear, I hear a clock ticking, you know, it's a lot yeah. of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> it, might, it might be Andre, I don't know, he just turned. Andre, uh, do you have the clock ticking? <laughs> ah, there you go. No, it was Andre. It was, <laughs> it was Andre. Andre yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I think that's uh, nice because there's uh, there's some uh, time to catch up. So uh, I'm gonna thank you for your very nice talk, uh, talks actually, and lectures. And so, uh, thank you for participating. And now I'm gonna introduce our next speaker. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Pablo. So. Uh, Oscar Vafek. I was going to introduce a bit more, uh, going to dive into the theory of interactions, I believe, uh, in, in uh, twisted systems. So, Oscar, the floor is yours. Uh, hey, thank you very much. Let me see if I can uh, share screen. Um, 
Um, let's see. Can you can you see this? Yeah, all is good. We can read it Great. perfectly. All right, thank you. Um, all right. Well, um, thanks a lot. Um, I will continue on this theme of uh, twisted bilayer graphene um, and uh, try to tell you a little bit about uh, correlations um, and their interplay with topology. Uh, Andre uh, mentioned some of this already and uh, Pablo uh, also touched upon this, but uh, yeah, we're gonna try to dive in a little bit more into this. Um, the plan is that in the first lecture, um, we'll try to cover some RG treatment and in particular, um, how do we actually project onto the narrow bands? And we're gonna find sort of a surprising result, um, namely that with Coulomb interactions, the system uh, flows towards the chiral limit. Um, I will introduce uh, exactly what this means um, and what are some of the consequences of that. We will not quite reach the chiral limit, but, but we, will, we will approach it. Um, and then uh, for the rest of the um, first lecture, I'll try to say something about uh, the strong coupling uh, theory once we are entirely within the narrow bands. Um, and then in the second lecture, which will be tomorrow, I will discuss some results of the DMRG on uh, a model for the narrow bands um, in which we consider single valley and single spin. Uh, we're gonna discover that there are some really interesting uh, many body phases, including a phase which does not break C2T symmetry, but doubles the unit cell. So it breaks translational symmetry and remarkably it's gapped. Um, and uh, the mechanism behind this, um, I will try to explain <clears throat> is this non-abelian Dirac node braiding. Um, and then um, we'll try to discuss in, in, in the second part of the second lecture, um, how to think about the single particle excitations uh, connected to the cascade transitions. Um, and um, then I will come back to the questions that have been asked before, namely, how do we think about 2D Vanier states in this topological narrow band? Um, and we'll find that it's actually a complementary uh, way of understanding the physics, um, which in some cases actually could be practical in that it allows us to understand the dependence on the screening um, uh, of various strong correlated uh, uh, phenomena, in particular, what happens to the gap and what happens to the effective mass of the excitation. So, so that's the plan. Maybe it's a bit too ambitious, but let's see how far we can get with this. And um, as usual, please feel free to uh, interrupt and uh, ask questions. Um, so I've been very fortunate to collaborate with Jian Kang, who was a postdoc at the Mag Lab. He's now on a faculty at Suzhou University in China. Uh, these are the papers uh, that uh, we co-authors based on which this um, set of lectures is, um, uh, is built. Um, and then in this last paper uh, on Cascade, we were very fortunate to also collaborate with Andre uh, Bernevik. So I don't need to introduce this too much, but uh, there will be an, a, 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 an intuition that I would like to give you uh, so you can keep in mind as we go along in this um, in this in this set of lectures. Um, so I will need to go back to uh, explaining uh, how to think about uh, the narrow bands. So um, um, so imagine we have uh, two honeycomb layers uh, rotated relative uh, to each other by some small angle theta. Um, if the angle is small, we will see that there is a new uh, super period which um, is long compared to the microscopic carbon carbon distance. Um, and this uh, new superpotential uh, will uh, scatter the Dirac, Dirac particles within uh, each of the monolayers, reconstruct uh, their spectrum, uh, and create a new set of bands. Um, and now, because uh, this period is so much larger, um, there's a fewer number of uh, electrons per uh, area that we need to add or subtract from these bands. Um, and so this now uh, is. Uh, perfectly uh, doable using a field effect uh, transistor type techniques um, uh, as opposed to doping, uh, which is what you would have to do if you wanted to change the uh, carry concentration 
in something like cuprate. So this can now be done reversibly. Now, uh, if we um, if we consider just uh, two decoupled layers for a second, so ignore the interlayer tunneling, um, then um, well, and they're relative relative to each other by some twist angle theta. Then let's say the bottom layer, which is uh, sketched by the blue, is going to have a large Brillouin zone, uh, which has the famous uh, Dirac cones, uh, Dirac points uh, in the corners of this Brillouin zone. So here, one of them is marked by K1. Um, and then the other layer, which is rotated relative to it, um, is going to have a rotated Brillouin zone by the twist angle theta. And, uh, and therefore, is Dirac. Uh, uh, point is going to fall onto a different uh, momentum point. Uh, this is marked by K2. And so for now, theoretically, let's just assume that the two layers are decoupled. And let's think about what would happen to the dispersion as we uh, move along this line that joins K1 and K2. Well, there's going to be a Dirac point uh, at K1 that's sketched over here with blue. And there's going to be a Dirac point at K2 that's sketched with red. And in the absence of any tunneling between the two layers, there will be no level repulsion. These uh, lines would cross over here and over here. And the energy scale associated with that crossing, well, it's uh, uh, the slope, which is set by the Fermi velocity, and then um, uh, half the displacement in momentum space uh, between these two uh, uh, direct points. Um, now, um, so, so that's so, so that's the energy scale here. Delta K is now the separation uh, between them. But now if we turn on the interlayer tunneling, um, and as we will see, there are two different uh, kinds of interlayer tunneling that we need to consider. W0 uh, corresponds to the interlayer tunneling through the AA region and W1 through the AB region. Um, then there will be a level of repulsion. These two uh, uh, levels will no longer cross. Um, and that's set by uh, this scale. And so now you can imagine that, um, let's say, holding the angle fixed so that the energy scale Vf delta k is fixed, so the energy scale associated with the crossing is fixed. And now you start increasing uh, the interlayer tunneling. These levels are going to push against each other uh, more and more. They will repel more. And eventually, you're going to start flattening out uh, the band um, that's left over. Um, and so you can imagine that there is some uh, special uh, condition um, when the ratio between this uh, 2w0 or w1 divided by uh, vf delta k is of order uh, 1, um, um, in which case the um, in which case the, uh, the band could get very flat. Uh, so that's the basic intuition. Um, now, uh, let's see. So suddenly I lost control. Let's see. Here we go. Um, so the uh, the separation between the cones uh, and therefore the energy scale uh, associated with the crossing is controlled by this uh, twist angle theta, um, um, while the interlayer tunneling is controlled by um, uh, by in principle uh, an external pressure okay um now uh, here's a more uh sophisticated uh, calculation based on the so-called continuum business and mcdonald model that, that we will come back to uh in which we're gonna continuously uh, decrease the angle from uh three degrees three degrees is uh, far away from the magic angle for twisted bilayer graphing um, and because we are decreasing uh the angle uh, we are increasing the period uh, of this new uh, superstructure in real space, and therefore we will be shrinking the Brillouin zone. But instead of uh, drawing this for uh, progressively smaller Brillouin zones, I'm just going to continuously rescale the size of the Brillouin zone so that the x axis in this little movie that is about to play will be uh, fixed. Um, and the cut uh, along which this is plotted is 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 shown here. Okay, so. Um, now the interlayer tunneling in this particular case is held fixed. Uh, and we see that as we decrease the angle, the levels push against each other more and more strongly. And eventually um, at about 1.1 degrees, 
well, I passed it. Let's see. Uh, the levels get rather flat. Um, and then if we continue past that point, you see they broaden again. And just this fact alone should already give you a hint that there is something uh, non-trivial about these bands, that they are not really um, flat because we took some well-localized states and separated them out to be very far away because uh, we know that the peaks in the local density of states um, are uh, associated with uh, um, are associated with the AA regions, and as we decrease the angle, these peaks move further and further apart. Um, so if the tunneling uh, was decreasing as we uh, decrease uh, uh, the angle and uh, increase the separation uh, between the uh, AA regions, then these bands should have continuously uh, uh, go down in its bandwidth, but that's not what we saw. We saw there was a kind of a magic uh, value, a special value at 1.1, where uh, the uh, angle got very small. Now, let's see, there's uh, a lot of things in the chat. Okay. All right. Um, so, um, so if there are any questions at all, for would be so kind and maybe just uh, uh, interrupt and uh, 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 and ask me. I won't be following the chat if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. I'm following. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, um, so that's already a first hint that these bands um, are not really uh, simply in the atomic limit. If, if they were in simply in the atomic limit, then as the uh, uh, peaks in the density of states continued to uh, separate out, uh, the bands would have to continue getting flat. Uh, that's not what we see. We see that there is a, a minimum in the bandwidth at a special value of the angle. And even when the angle decreases um, uh, past that minimum, uh, the bands sort of broaden again. All right, uh, I guess there's no need to introduce this. Uh, Pablo uh, has already discussed uh, many of these um, amazing phenomena that are seen within these narrow bands as we uh, um, uh, as we add carriers, uh, uh, starting from uh, uh, empty uh, narrow bands, that's this uh, uh, minus four, uh, and then continuously filling it up with up to eight electrons per uh, unit cell, um, uh, with the amazing correlative phases that appear uh, uh, at integral fillings um, and the superconductivity uh, near uh, the integral fillings at um, minus, near minus two and, and plus two. Um, so the, the motivation is to try to understand uh, what's going on uh, due to these correlations. Um, uh, Paolo's experiments uh, were uh, quickly uh, reproduced and extended by uh, Andrea Young and Corey Dean's group, where um, they took uh, a twisted bilayer uh, device, which was away from the magic angle. So at 1.27, remember the magic angle under ambient pressure would be 1.1. And um, the, the trace for the conductance um, at the 1.27 uh, is shown by this uh, gray curve here. Um, Okay, there's a dip at the neutrality uh, point, but other than that, uh, there isn't a well-developed correlated state at minus two, uh, at minus two or at, at two. Um, and so you see, we are not at the magic angle uh, condition under ambient pressure. Uh, but then uh, remarkably, when, you, when they apply uh, uh, pressure, so in this particular case, we should be thinking about this as the energy um, associated with the level crossing is fixed because the angle is fixed. As they apply external pressure, they are increasing the interlayer tunneling. Um, and so now uh, uh, the level of repulsion gets stronger um, and they uh, flatten out uh, the band. Um, and remarkably, um, upon um, an optimal value of the pressure, uh, indeed, the correlated states at minus two and two, and in fact, uh, signatures uh, at one uh, and at three uh, appear. Um, uh, these experiments were then um, uh, also remarkably extended by uh, Dmitry Efetov's group, where they saw uh, correlated states uh, at almost every uh, integer uh, and superconductivity almost everywhere in between. So um, now, in order for us to uh, build a theory for the correlations in the narrow bands, uh, we're going to try to uh, uh, integrate out in the renormalization group sense 
uh, the remote beds. Um, and uh, systematically uh, study what happens within the uh, narrow beds. Um, I will describe a procedure for this, but before I do that, I'd like to uh, make the following uh, a comment, which will be useful to keep in mind uh, as partly a, a motivation for uh, doing this uh, RG uh, treatment. So first, as Pablo has already mentioned, there is an extreme sensitivity of these correlated states uh, in the twisted bilayer uh, graphene to the twist angle. So for example, the data that he showed, uh, shown on the right here, shows the superconducting optimal transition temperature uh, as a function of the twist angle um, uh, shows uh, uh, that even if you deviate uh, from the magic uh, value by 10%, the TC drops, uh, the optimal TC drops precipitously. Um, similar uh, result was uh, presented by Andrea Young's group. Uh, so this is the superconducting uh, dome as a function of the uh, angle. You see an extreme sensitivity to the twist angle. Um, and also uh, this uh, middle plot shows the activation gap at mu equal to minus two uh, correlated insulator state uh, as a function of the twist angle. And again, you see that there is a extreme sensitivity to that, uh, uh, to that angle. So the activation gap drops uh, very quickly as you move away from the magic angle. Now, um, so this made us revisit the question of the Fermi velocity renormalization. Um, so why is this? Well, uh, as I mentioned, the important ratio that sets whether the band is narrow uh, is the interlayer uh, uh, level repulsion in the numerator um, to the energy associated with this level crossing, which in addition to the angle dependence, also has Fermi velocity dependence. Now, Fermi velocity is usually assumed to be a constant uh, in graphene. But in fact, as has been uh, uh, known theoretically a long time ago in this beautiful work by uh, Gonzalez, Paco Guinea, and Maria Mediano, um, the Coulomb interactions reshape the dispersion of the Dirac cone. Uh, and they make the dispersion in the vicinity of the uh, uh, charge neutrality point steeper. This, uh, so, so as this, um, uh, as this cartoon on the right shows, uh, upon inclusion of the uh, Coulomb interactions, the Dirac cone would go from uh, the, uh, uh, the unrenormalized cone to the cone which has uh, this uh, enhancement of the Fermi velocity uh, shown inside here. Um, as we approach the Dirac point. Now, uh, this effect has been observed uh, by Gaiman and Losevov on suspended monolayer graphene samples, where they remarkably saw uh, almost a factor of two, uh, or about a factor of two enhancement of Fermi velocity. Now, uh, if this happened, there would be a huge change in the uh, magic angle condition simply because the VF in the denominator would uh, be off by this uh, large factor. Um, in addition, uh, they observed an enhancement of the Fermi velocity due to Coulomb interactions in uh, monolayer graphene samples deposited on the hexagonal boronitride, where they saw about 20% enhancement of the uh, Fermi velocity. Again, um, this extreme sensitivity of the correlated phenomena um, would then uh, be able to detect uh, this uh, change, this 20% change uh, of the Fermi velocity. Uh, more recent data by Andrea Young's group uh, has also seen uh, this enhancement of Fermi velocity uh, on hexagonal boronitride encapsulated uh, samples. Um, the reason for the different um, uh, magnitude of this uh, increase uh, is that in the suspended samples, uh, the, there is no dielectric screening, um, uh, while in the deposited samples on hexagonal boronitride or encapsulated, uh, we also have to deal with the uh, dielectric constant of the hexagonal boronitride, and then and that decreases the Coulomb interaction um, by about a factor of five. Uh, so as I mentioned, um, 
this extreme sensitivity of the correlated states to the angle uh, makes us think, uh, uh, go back and to try to understand why don't we see um, the uh, shifts in this uh, uh, magic angle condition for devices which would be in different dielectric environments. So for example, um, systems which would be deposited on uh, hexagonal boronitride, so they only have, uh, so that they're exposed to the air from one side would have a different dielectric environment than the samples which are encapsulated. Um, and so I, I will, so in the first uh, part of the lecture, I will show you that this RG uh, uh, treatment that we developed uh, is able to explain this uh, insensitivity uh, to the dielectric environment um, of the magic angle. So to proceed, we're gonna use the Bishop's and McDonald model that has been mentioned by uh, Andre and uh, uh, Pablo in the previous uh, talks. Uh, this is a, uh, a continuum model, um, which has already dispensed with the information about the microscopic underlying carbon, uh, carbon lattice. And the only um, excitations which are uh, kept are the excitations in the vicinity of the Dirac cone. And uh, this is partly the answer to the question that was asked before and Pablo answered, uh, namely, uh, what about commensurate versus incommensurate angles um, at this level uh, of the long wavelength uh, continuum uh, theory, there is no uh, difference between commensurate and incommensurate angles. So, um, so this, so this um, uh, uh, business of McDonald Hamiltonian uh, is written uh, here for uh, one valley. Um, the other valley is related by time reversal symmetry. And it's a four by four uh, uh, differential operator. Um, so the upper two by two block uh, acts in the uh, sublattice space. So this Pauli matrix sigma acts in the A or B uh, sublattice. Um, and then this uh, tunneling uh, matrix function um, describes the tunneling through the AA regions uh, parametrized by W0. Um, and then the tunneling through the AB regions parametrized by uh, W1, okay? Um, and there's a nice way to uh, think about this. Oh yeah, so I should also say that um, this uh, subscript theta on the Pauli matrix here simply means that you take, um, a two component vector, so sigma x and sigma y, and then you rotate it about the z-axis by the small twist angle uh, uh, theta. Now, the information about the twist angle uh, resides in the interlayer tunneling. So these um, momenta q, j, uh, they know about the twist angle and they know about the new periodicity of the system. Um, and then in addition to that, uh, there's also the information about the twist angle in this Pauli matrix. Now, it turns out that this um, small uh, angle change of the Pauli matrix um, is, uh, is basically negligible uh, effect uh, at, the, at the narrow band. It's, it's, a, it's a small perturbation to the problem where you ignore this small angle uh, difference. There's actually a good theoretical reason uh, uh, beyond this, to, to ignore this is actually a higher order uh, term. In any case, what was noticed by uh, Andre Brnovich's group and by uh, Leon Balance's group uh, is that if you ignore this small uh, twist angle uh, uh, rotation of this Pauli matrix, then this non-interacting uh, business of McDonald Hamiltonian enjoys a perfect particle hole uh, symmetry. And this will be uh, useful for us as we uh, go along. I will explain exactly in detail what this particle hole symmetry uh, is. So this is what we have at our uh, disposal um, as our effective low energy uh, theory. And by the way, uh, it's, it is this type of Hamiltonian that has been diagonalized. Um, and I showed you this uh, uh, band structure as a function of the twist angle um, uh, in my uh, earlier slides uh, where we saw the band flattening. All right, so there's a nice way to think about this problem. Um, that was introduced by uh, Leon Balance, namely to think about this as an effective field theory um, in which uh, this is a leading order gradient expansion uh, uh, of, uh, um, of the continuum field theory. And so, so now let's try to think about, let's try to add electron correlations to this problem 
um, we're not going to focus na only on the narrow bands. We're just going to try to treat the problem uh, with all the remote bands of this business of McDonald's Hamiltonian. So the kinetic energy uh, is going to be described by this four by four uh, uh, Hamiltonian uh, matrix uh, for the uh, for um, for the valley K, and then another four by four, which is related to it by spinless time error symmetry uh, for the valley K prime. And these chi fields here, uh, sigma corresponds to spin up and down. Um, and the psi here are the exact wave functions of the business of McDonald Hamiltonian, which um, live at the crystal momentum K, their band is N. Um, and then um, uh, and the top component lives in the valley K. Okay, the bottom component then lives in the valley K prime, which is related by time error symmetry. Um, so now the Coulomb interactions uh, at this uh, uh, point, we can write down um, uh, as following. This delta rho is a, a, a fluctuation density operator. So it's a, so it's a, it's a density um, uh, minus the background density. At this point, this uh, anti-commutator is simply a constant. Um, and we are free to subtract a constant uh, from uh, this uh, density fluctuation uh, operator as long as we adjust the chemical potential uh, properly. And the particle hole symmetry actually allows us to fix the chemical potential in this problem. So um, the, um, at, the, uh, at the bare UV scale, our Coulomb interactions can be written uh, in this form. Okay. Uh, it will be useful for us to think about this uh, term that we are subtracting because we will renormalize this term um, uh, through the spectral decomposition. It's uh, it, due to particle symmetry. It can be written as this uh, sum over uh, all the states um, uh, below the upper energy cutoff uh, E C down to the neutrality point. So, so that's the term that is being subtracted. Okay. Um, so now um, we know. That in a monolayer graphene, um, even if the sample was suspended, the Coulomb interactions do not appear to be strong enough to gap out the charge neutrality point. In other words, whatever putative quantum phase transition there would be with strong Coulomb repulsion, we are sitting on the semi metallic side of that phase transition. Um, now, in the case which uh, we're considering here, we also have the screening due to the hexagonal boron nitride. So the Coulomb interactions are suppressed relative to the uh, Coulomb interactions in the suspended samples. Um, and so uh, we are actually deeper in the monolayer graph on the uh, semi metallic side of any putative quantum phase transition that would happen with stronger uh, uh, Coulomb repulsion. So we know, therefore, that we can treat the effects of the Coulomb interaction in monolayer graphene uh, perturbatively. And this was, of course, done in this uh, pioneering paper by uh, Gonzalez, uh, Guinea, and Cosmediano. And what they found out, as I mentioned, is the steepening of the uh, Fermi velocity. Now, the problem that we are facing uh, now is, is a little bit more complicated because, in addition to, of course, the Dirac dispersion, we also have the interlayer tunnel. However, we can split the energy into three different regimes. There is a regime um, between our UV cutoff, which is set by the Fermi velocity divided by the carbon-carbon distance. So this is of the order of EV, maybe 2 EV, uh, down to an energy scale, which is of the order of the interlayer tunneling, which um, is marked here by EC star. And in this regime, um, the Coulomb interaction is perturbative, uh, and so is uh, the interlayer tunnel, because we're at high energies compared to the interlayer tunnel. Now, and there, if you were to try to solve this problem numerically, there would be thousands of bands here. Um, so trying to eliminate these bands numerically um, is uh, probably impossible because there's simply too many of them. But we'll find out that we can treat this analytically in a very nice way. Then there is another intermediate regime 
below this energy scale EC star. This energy scale is not sharply defined. It is only of the order of W1. And we should think about this as an energy scale at which a, a perturbative treatment of the interlayer tunneling in stage one um, starts breaking down. Okay, So below EC star, but before we reach the narrow bands, the interlayer tunneling is no longer perturbative. It's non-perturbative. So we have to keep it exactly in the Green's functions. But we still have a gap to the remote bands. Um, and so Coulomb interaction uh, would then be perturbative uh, in stage two. OK? Um, and then finally, we will have integrated out all the remote bands. And we are left with just the narrow bands, which we have magnified in this picture by 10. And now within this last stage, uh, the Coulomb interaction is stronger than the bandwidth. And here, both the Coulomb interaction and the interlayer tunneling uh, are non-perturbative. So it is in this last step that we will switch to strong coupling uh, approach. So that's the strategy. So in stage one, we take our fields, electron fields, we split them into fast and slow. Uh, by fast, we mean all the modes whose exact business of McDonald energy sits between the cutoff EC and some sliding cutoff EC prime, okay? Such that the EC prime is still much, much larger than W0 or W1, so that we have not entered into a regime where the interlayer tunneling becomes non perturbative. Um, now, uh, the Coulomb interaction will then uh, contain fast and slow modes. We're going to integrate out the fast modes. And uh, at leading order, we will be left with the renormalization of the self energy. And uh, this renormalization due to the uh, Coulomb interaction of the self energy contain um, this function delta f, which um, can be written in terms of the exact uh, eigenfunctions of the BM model. Um, uh, uh, this way, it's a sum over all block states uh, in this energy window EC and EC prime. Um, it's a sign sum because uh, some of them are occupied, some of them are unoccupied. Um, and, uh, and in addition to that, what happens is that if you integrate out the fast modes, this background term, which is being subtracted, um, now also uh, has this uh, new cutoff scale EC prime uh, in it, okay? Um, and so our goal is then to figure out by how much is this term changing the business of McDonald Hamiltonian. And this looks complicated because we, it looks like we need the exact wave functions of the business of McDonald model. But as I mentioned, um, we have an advantage that in the stage one, um, the problem is perturbative in the interlayer tunneling. So we're going to take the sum over all the uh, uh, exact eigenstates between EC, the UV cutoff, and sliding cutoff EC prime. And we're going to rewrite it um, through a, a Cauchy integral of uh, a, a Green's function. Um, uh, remember, in the spectral decomposition of the Green's function, the wave functions sit in the numerator. And then z minus the energy of those wave functions sit in the denominator. The first one is evaluated at r. The second one is at r prime. So that's this r and r prime. And then the Cauchy contour, contour that we choose is in a counterclockwise sense, encircling ec prime and ec on the right. And then in the clockwise sense, uh, encircling uh, minus ec prime and ec uh, on the left. And that's going to give us this sign that we need over here. And so once we have it written in terms of the uh, Green's function, then we can just do a standard perturbative uh, uh, expansion of this Green's function. Uh, in this particular case, uh, the perturbative expansion is in the interlayer tunneling. So the zeroth order diagram, when we ignore the interlayer, interlayer tunneling, is just the, the one that was considered a um, long time ago. Um, uh, and it gives us this self energy. And is this self energy that was responsible for the uh, uh, logarithmic increase of the uh, Coulomb interaction. Um, now we have a second uh, uh, diagram, which will also, which I will show, is also logarithmic, um, in which uh, we scatter 
by one of these more wave vectors uh, q. So this is what this dashed line with x is supposed to represent. All right, so let's just go, since this is a school, we should uh, uh, explain the calculations. Um, uh, so let's go through the, uh, the, the first term, the self-energy. Uh, we have our contour integral uh, uh, written over here, over z, and then we just simply have um, the Coulomb interaction and the bare um, Green's function uh, unperturbed by the interlayer tunneling. Okay, we write this Green's function in the spectral decomposition um, so that the uh, Cauchy integrals are easy to uh, perform. And uh, uh, this is, of course, just a projector onto the helicities um, that can. Uh, that can easily be done. Um, and what we discover is that we have this integral. Uh, now, because um, we are interested in the behavior of the self energy at uh, low uh, energy, so low K, this is our external momentum, we can expand this. Is a question? Uh, yeah, it's actually me that has the question. <laughs> I, okay, have, yeah. I have the question. Uh, mm -hmm. So here you're taking the interaction to be the same as that uh, 90s paper, like this one over uh, absolute value of K. So it's the end screen. Uh, That's right. That's right. Right now you see, so so the only place where the screening would come in is through the dielectric environment. So this epsilon would be about four and a half um, for the uh, hexagonal boron nitride. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And so that means that your calculation is strictly speaking for the moment at uh, a charge neutrality. Or... Not necessarily, not necessarily. So, so right now we're just integrating out modes uh, from high energy, but then eventually how many particles we consider within the narrow band, uh, you see, we are still far away from the narrow band. Mm. And once we are left with a theory that contains only the modes within the narrow band, we can study that theory at different fillings. This is not necessarily just at the charge neutrality. No. I, I guess I'm confused that by the fact that the Coulomb interaction is long range. Uh... Yeah, so, so, so the only thing that would screen the Coulomb interaction at this point, the only thing that would screen the long range part of the Coulomb interaction at this point are the gates. So mm. if the, there is nothing uh, in the hexagonal right, right, boron right, nitride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, I understand now. You're, you're just like, yeah, okay. You're, you're just going down in energy and then right. that will screen eventually. Yeah, thanks. You're thanks. welcome. All right. Um, now, um, okay. So, so at this point, the external momentum case uh, is, is small compared to uh, Q, which has to sit in this window. And so we can just expand um, the uh, Coulomb part this way. Now, you see, naively, we get one over Q piece here. Um, and that would make this, um, uh, however, that term makes, uh, uh, makes the integral vanish by the angle integration. So in fact, it is the next order term that gives rise to the logarithm. Uh, uh, and then uh, once we, uh, so once we do this expansion, uh, uh, we see that we have a Q mu, Q nu here. The uh, angle integration uh, tells us that uh, Q mu, Q nu is gonna have to be um, a half of delta mu nu Q squared. So then the integra angle integration is easy to perform. Um, and then we are just simply left with rather trivial uh, 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 integration over the magnitude of Q. Um, that gives us um, the renormalization of the uh, sigma dot p term in the Coulomb, in the uh, Dirac particle. There's a log which knows about the ratio of these two scales. And then there's a coefficient which knows about the Coulomb interaction, um, uh, including this famous factor of a quarter. All right, so that's, uh, that's, that's simple. Um, now, uh, so we see uh, if we carefully uh, compare with our bare term, that uh, this, this, this corresponds to an enhancement of, um, the, um, of the Fermi velocity uh, as we approach the Dirac point uh, due to the Coulomb interaction with the remote phase. Um, okay, in the stage one. So now uh, let's consider the, the second term. This is a new term, it, has not, it was not considered before. Um, it's perturbatively expanded in the Ws and so this, uh, Tj here corresponds to the visitor McDonald uh, T um, uh, interlayer tunneling that scatters uh, from Q to uh, Q plus G1. Um, 
And now we just have to perform this integral. Um, again, we are going to make a spectral decomposition of these uh, uh, Green's functions. Uh, sorry, sorry, this should be G0. Um, and now we see that we have, in this contour integral, uh, we have um, four possibilities. Um, either the two poles um, are, um, uh, so either we choose the same sign in the denominator, or we choose the opposite sign in the denominator. If we choose the same sign in the denominator, um, then either the two, both of these uh, uh, energies are uh, inside or both of them are outside uh, of the contour, um, or one of them is inside, the other one is outside, but only by a little bit. So it turns out that if both of them are inside and both of them are outside, the integral identically vanishes, the contour integral. If one of them is in and the other one is out, maybe there's a contribution. But it turns out that, that contribution gets canceled by the next shell of the RG. And you can easily convince yourself that that's the case simply by enlarging um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the window over which you're tracing out the poles. So in fact, the only contribution uh, that is logarithmically large and really contributes to the uh, flow, the RG flow, is when one of these poles uh, is inside of the contour with the minus sign, let's say, and the other one is outside with the plus sign, okay? For which there are two contributions. Um, uh, okay, so it's just a simple contour integral. You know how to evaluate this. Uh, we get this expression. Uh, it looks uh, a bit complicated, but in fact, remember, we are at this point trying to perform a gradient expansion in the spirit of uh, the effective field theory. Um, and so uh, we can uh, expand in small k, okay? And the leading order term that we would get is just simply setting k to zero uh, and setting these g's to zero in the denominator. Okay, everything else will not contribute uh, logarithmic uh, uh, anything. Anything is logarithmic, and you can see that this is logarithmic simply by power counting. You get one power of q in a denominator here, you get another power of q in a denominator in d, and you get two powers of q in the measure. So at k equal to zero and at g uh, equal to uh, zero. Uh, this is where the key logarithm is. Everything else is sub log. I see there's another question. Um, can you repeat what is the physical meaning of the sign of the denominator in the Green's function, please? Um, the physical meaning of the sign uh, in the denominator is the following. If you take um, a Green's function for um, uh, just a Dirac, uh, unperturbed Dirac particle, right? So you know that it propagates both helicities, okay? So the, the, the physical meaning of the numerator is a projector onto a helicity, uh, okay? So if you project onto, let's say, positive helicity, that's the minus sign in the numerator, okay? Then uh, that corresponds, uh, sorry, when you project onto positive helicity, that's the plus sign in the numerator, um, that corresponds to having a pole at positive energy uh, via uh, Q and vice versa for the other one. So hopefully that answers the question. Okay, so coming back to uh, calculation of this renormalization, um, well, um, we see that, uh, that, that this is the term that is logarithmic. Um, and now we have this interesting situation where we are sandwiching the Mrs. and McDonald tunneling matrix uh, between these two projectors. So um, the projectors have to have opposite helicity. So, uh, so it's either the plus sign on the top and the minus plus sign on the left uh, and a minus sign on the right, or it's a minus sign on the left. And we have to add that um, to the plus sign on the right. Now, the interlayer tunneling, okay, is itself a matrix. Um, and let's see. Uh, so that matrix contains an identity uh, that's the one that's proportional to W0. And then uh, it contains a piece which is proportional to uh, sigma X and sigma Y. Remember, sigmas uh, act in the sublattice uh, space. Um, and that's, that piece contains, uh, that, that's proportional to W1, the interlayer tunneling through the AB region. Now, imagine that you substitute just this first piece that's proportional to identity here. So you can immediately see that in that case, the numerator vanishes because you have a projector onto positive helicity, identity, and projector onto negative helicity, and the product of the projectors is zero. So we see there will be no log renormalization 
of the interlayer tunneling through the AA region. On the other hand, if we have a sigma X or sigma Y over here, then that can actually flip uh, the uh, helicity or it can, it can make a superposition of the helicity. So that one will survive. And the simplest way to see that is now imagine performing the angle integral. Okay, you open up this bracket, there are three terms. So there's an identity T identity. Then there's gonna be a piece which contains one power of Q hat that vanishes by angle integration. And then there's a piece which contains two powers of Q hat. Uh, that's simply uh, one half delta mu nu, just as before. Uh, and so it's gonna uh, get us uh, sigma mu, sigma nu, that's the delta mu nu, it gives us a trace. And then we have to put a sigma x or sigma y in between. And no matter which one you put in there, because uh, mu runs over uh, x and y, this will also vanish. So the so everything except for the identity term in the projector for the sigma x and sigma y term in the interlayer tunneling uh, will vanish. The only one which will survive is the identity sigma x sigma y identity. Okay, um, and so if you do that, you find another logarithm, and that's a log renormalization of the w one. So uh, now, so we see that W1 also increases at low moment, at low momenta due to the Coulomb interaction. And so now we can write uh, our flow equations. The, the first one is just the uh, famous flow equation from, uh, uh, from Gonzalez, uh, Maria Gosmediano and uh, Paco Pinea uh, to one loop. Uh, the second one tells us that the interlayer tunneling through the AA region does not renormalize. Oops, sorry. Uh, and the last one uh, uh, is just the renormalization of the uh, interlayer tunneling through the AB region. Now, notice that in this RG scheme, I am not rescaling the momentum back to its uh, original uh, UV cutoff value, which is usually done in textbooks uh, on Wilsonian RG. There's no uh, you don't have to do this. You can just continue, continuously uh, decrease um, uh, the number of degrees of freedom that you have in the system and decrease the cutoff. It would be actually useful to do that in our case uh, as we switch to stage two. So uh, this is the reason why you don't actually see the engineering dimensions uh, of these couplings. Um, if I were to rescale the cutoff back and rescale the fields, you would also see the engineering dimension. But um, uh, here you don't see that. In any case, you can see that there's a difference between the AA tunneling and the AB tunneling uh, flow due to Coulomb interaction. So now, these equations are not hard to solve. In the first equation, the right-hand side is a constant, so we can easily integrate it. And once we have the scale dependence of the Fermi velocity, we can just simply substitute it in here into the last equation. Uh, it's a separable equation, so we can move W1 to the left-hand side and do the integral on both sides um, and, uh, uh, and, and easily solve it. Um, so then what we, fi then what we find uh, is the following. The ratio of uh, W1 to uh, delta K, which I'm not writing here, times Pf, uh, is actually an RG invariant. In other words, um, the interlayer tunneling through the AB region renormalizes just as fast as the Vf increases to keep this ratio fixed. On the other hand, because W0 does not renormalize due to Coulomb interaction in this order. The ratio of W0 to W1 actually decreases um, as we approach low energies. And it, uh, it decreases through this logarithm. So if we could set the upper cutoff to infinity, okay, it's not infinite because uh, there is a, there's a natural UV cutoff to this uh, Dirac dispersion, but if we if we did this as a field theory, then this log would diverge, and this would tell us that before we even reach the stage two RG, um, the ratio between the A A tunneling and the A B tunneling shrinks to zero, and that's interesting because uh, that's the so-called chiral limit defined uh, by Ternopolsky, uh, Kruchkov, and uh, Vishwanath. Um, in which they uh, studied the business and McDonald model at the non-interacting level simply by setting W0 uh, to zero. So we see we are flowing towards this parallel. Now, the cutoff is itself not infinite. 
it's um, uh, uh, it's maybe two EV. Um, and then the um, the scale at which we have to stop stage one RG is itself set by a few W1. So that's going to be, let's say, about 200 MeV. So maybe we can get uh, uh, maybe we can get a factor of 10, um, maybe a little bit more inside of this logarithm. But uh, it's not going to be uh, infinite. OK. Um, in addition, we have this uh, uh, annoying factor of four that decreases uh, the, the magnitude here and the dielectric constant, which itself is about four. So, so this is indeed a suppression of W0 over W1 in the realistic samples, but it is not going to bring us all the way to the chiral limit. We are approaching this chiral limit. If one could engineer devices where this dielectric constant was, uh, was closer to one, the effect would be stronger. Um, just as the VF enhancement um, in the uh, monolayer graphene uh, observed by Gaim and Vosilov was stronger uh, when the samples were suspended. Um, in any case, the, the first result uh, explains uh, what I mentioned originally, namely that the value of the magic angle is largely insensitive to the Coulomb interaction because the strong dependence of the band flatness is actually on the ratio of W1 uh, and H bar and uh, delta KVF. Uh, there's a much, much weaker dependence uh, on this ratio. All right. Now, um, so how about stage two? So in stage two, we need to uh, switch um, uh, and treat the interlayer tunneling non perturbatively while we still treat the uh, Coulomb interaction perturbatively. So the way we do that is um, we sim simply take, uh, so we go to band bases, okay? Um, we have a um, certain number of bands above and certain number of bands below, anywhere between 20 and 70 bands above and below. And then uh, we simply integrate out the highest uh, energy uh, band and the lowest energy band away from uh, the charge uh, neutrality point. So the charge neutrality point is not touched, right? So we are approaching uh, from above. Um, and as we do that, we compute this delta F, RR prime. That gives us a renormalization of the Bissett and McDonald Hamiltonian, now written in the band basis. Um, we rotate the basis such that we diagonalize that term. That rotates our Coulomb interaction. Uh, and uh, we continue this until we are left uh, with just the narrow bands, which we don't touch at this point. So the example of how this would run um, uh, here, I just chose to illustrate this on a chiral limit. So uh, W0 is set to zero already. Uh, you don't have to do that. Um, it's shown here. There'll be a little movie uh, where we start with, um, um, I think it's 30 bands above or 30, maybe 40 above and 40 below. Um, and at first, we have all the bands. And hopefully, you can see this movie running. Uh, we are removing the bands um, uh, one by one. Uh, and renormalize the dispersion. As you see, the uh, the remote bands are indeed going up in energy. Um, yeah, so they're 40 above and 40 below. And eventually, we are left just with the uh, narrow bands. Okay. And uh, at this point, we can no longer treat the problem perturbatively. Uh, the bandwidth is small um, compared to the Coulomb interaction, and we're going to switch to strong couple. But we know which uh, problem uh, we should be studying uh, in strong coupling. In particular, this background subtra subtraction is uh, is clearly um, uh, clearly isolated uh, in this particular case. Now, um, as I mentioned, this uh, scale E C star at which we stop the stage one and start stage two um, is uh, is arbitrary. Um, it's defined only up to um, uh, making sure that stage one is under control. Okay, so nobody tells me that I should choose this to be three uh, W one versus ten W one. I could have chosen uh, as long as stage one is under control. Um, I'm free to choose this uh, scale E C star um, uh, differently. And of course, the physical result cannot depend on where I stop stage one and start stage two. Um, and so what we do is we demonstrate this uh, in these two plots. So NC in this plot 
is the number of bands above and below which are kept in stage two. Okay, so um, on the left, you see the band structures obtained after uh, RG um, uh, procedure uh, in stage two. We haven't finished the stage two procedure yet. We still have some bands left, but we chose a different number. So we have chose a different UV cutoff for stage two. And as you can clearly see, um, the results that you get depend on the upper cutoff. Okay, um, that's because we have not renormalized the F and Ws based on the result of stage one. But if we do that, if we scale um, the uh, uh, the problem on the left with the result obtained from stage one, you see a perfect collapse of these bands. So this demonstrates that um, the flows from stage one, which are analytical, and the numerically determined flow from stage two um, seamlessly uh, cross into each other, um, and the result does not depend on where we stop. Is there a question? Yeah, there's a question by uh, Miguel Garcia. Um, can one relate the decreasing ratio, um, I guess it's W0, W1, uh, with the fact that flat band states are localized at AA regions? Uh, I'm not sure how, when that's um whether that relationship exists and I, I don't see why i mean at high energies you sort of don't really know much about the flat bands um it, it really just simply comes from the effect i showed you i don't know how to explain it any better than um you know you have this uh two opposite helicity um uh uh propagators uh, sandwiching uh the interlayer tunneling um and uh as you saw, uh, there's no effect on uh, on uh, um, the interlayer tunneling through the AA region, but I don't think it has anything to do um, with um, the density of states being the local density of states being peaked at the AA. Right. Another question. Uh, and there's a second question. Yeah, um, by Mert, uh, how would the RG equations change if you include next loop orders uh, in the first stage? Do they leave the qualitative picture invariant? Right, so they have to because uh, it's perturbative under control. Okay. So, uh, okay. So, okay. So, so this demonstrates that we can stop the analytical RG and continue with the numerical RG um, with uh, exact uh, wave functions um, uh, seamlessly. And, um, uh, okay. And uh, the other point I'd like to make is that at this point, instead of having thousands of bands that we need to renormalize, we only have about 20, if you want to push it, 72, it doesn't really matter, as you see here. Um, and that's numerically uh, perfectly feasible. It's not a problem. All right. So um, now, what happens uh, under stage two? So at this point, we can only probe this numerically. So one of the things we can check is the so-called sublattice polarization. Um, so we, we know that in the chiral limit, um, the wave functions of the narrow band can be chosen to be perfectly sublattice polarized. In other words, while they can live on both layers, the wave functions would live entirely on the A sublattice in one um, band and uh, in the other sublattice B um, for the other band. So, uh, however, if we go away from the um, chiral limit, just in the business McDonald model, then we find um, that while there is some sublattice uh, polarization, it's not perfect, okay? Uh, it's actually rather small. So the picture on the left shows you the bare sublattice polarization for the narrow band. And then um, once we are done with stage two, we see uh, the sublattice polarization uh, numerically determined, and we see that it's much stronger. Okay, so this also suggests that even during the stage two, which is only numerical, we are indeed going towards the chiral limit. Now, um, this is, I don't know how much time I have left, but this is the last part I'd like to uh, discuss uh, uh, because I think it will nicely uh, um, connect with uh, hopefully what's, what uh, 
Titus is going to talk about, um, namely um, uh, hybrid Vanier uh, basis. So, um, and, and this will come in as a way to check what's happening during the stage two of RRG. So as was uh, discussed in this very nice paper, um, um, we can imagine we take the position operator, it's really a periodic version of a position operator with this delta Q um, uh, sketched here uh, being a small uh, difference between the two Q points in the Brillouin zone along this direction. Um, for example, uh, we take this operator, we project it onto the narrow bands, and then we diagonalize this operator, okay? So uh, now uh, clearly uh, the momentum along uh, G2 is a good quantum number. So the eigenstates and the eigenvalues of this operator will be eigenstates, uh, can be labeled by uh, this uh, K. Um, okay, so there's a procedure for how to do this. I'm not gonna go through it in detail. Um, I just I just like to point out that the um, the eigenvalues are related to the expectation value of the uh, position uh, operator along this direction delta q um, in the units of the Moray uh, uh, period L n. Okay, so um, so these are the famous uh, Wilson loops which were uh, asked about and and, and touched upon uh, previously. And um, for those of you who are not familiar with them, we can think of them uh, uh, as sort of uh, an expectation value of the center of uh, the chart. And, and now we can study what happens to that uh, expectation value as a function of the good quantum number k. So in particular, as we change this k, uh, does the expectation value move to the left or to the right? Does it drift across the Brillouin zone um, the way the Landau tube uh, wave functions would uh, in the Landau gauge? Uh, um, uh, Landau levels. Okay, now, but before I do that, let me just show you what the wave functions actually look like. So uh, they're indeed extended in one direction and localized in the other direction, but they're not really just simple Gaussians. Okay, they're not really like the lowest Landau level wave function. So even though the centers may be drifting left and right, the distributions, they are um, highly structured. Um, so these four plots on the left uh, take one of these hybrid binary state wave functions um, uh, in the central unit cells, that's the zero, the first zero. And the second zero says that the uh, good quantum number wave vector k is set to zero. Uh, and they're decomposed into two different um, layers and two different sublattices. So this is a top layer sublattice A, top layer sublattice B, bottom layer sublattice A, bottom layer sublattice B. Um, you see the peaks are still sitting on these AA positions, which are marked by these uh, uh, black dots. So, so the peaks in the wave function form this triangle lattice centered on uh, AA, okay? Now, as we change the momentum, so now we go from zero to 0.5, you see that the distribution is still peaked on the A sub lattice, but the expectation value of a position, which would be somewhere in the middle, uh, here in this left picture, uh, moves to the left here. So, so when we say that the Wilson loop winds, uh, we're really only just saying something about the, um, the mean of the distribution, uh, but the distributions them themselves are rather complicated okay, and structured. Okay, so here are the Wilson loops, just simply for the unrenormalized, non-interacting, this is a McDonald's model. As we change this dimensionless parameter of the A, A to A B tunnel. So the picture on the top left is the chiral limit. Um, and we see that the two bands per valley per spin uh, indeed uh, have a topology to them. They wind as Andre advertised. So we can think of them as one of them having a churn one, forming a churn one, and one of them forming a churn minus one. Okay. And this is true regardless of the ratio of W0 to W1. Um, as we start increasing this ratio, uh, we still see this wind. But uh, you see the shape of the Wilson loop is actually changing uh, as you move away from the chiral limit. The topology doesn't, but the geometry does. Now, so now what we can do is we can take the bare value of uh, our interactions, um, and that's the blue, uh, to be 
what's considered to be the realistic value, so 0.83, it should really be measured in UV for us to be sure. And the Wilson loop for that, okay, it winds, but you see uh, is this blue uh, curve. Um, and then we can study it under RG, okay? So after stage one, which is analytical, not surprisingly, the Wilson loop steepens. Uh, and this is this red curve. It's not surprising because we are moving towards the chiral limit. But now in stage two, which is all done numerically and within the band basis, uh, we also see that the Wilson loop continues steepening. Okay, so uh, indeed, uh, uh, at the end of stage two, uh, we have um, we have renormalized Wilson loop, um, which is closer to the chiral limit. And for this particular case, it would take us from about 0.83 to maybe 0.6, maybe a little bit less. Um, now, let me make a comment about um, frozen remote band approximation, which is adopted in many papers in literature. This is not done here. Now, um, a lot of people freeze the remote bands, but in this case, the completeness of the single particle Hilbert space guarantees that if you freeze the remote band Hilbert space, you are also freezing the Hilbert space of the narrow bands. Um, and so, while the energies of the narrow bands can change due to interaction with the frozen remote bands, um, the narrow band wave functions uh, do not, of course, up to trivial unitary rotation. So that subspace is fixed. Now, the sublattice polarization operator and the Wilson loop eigenvalues are determined by the projection operator onto the narrow band subspace. And because that does not change, the sublattice Wilson loops, um, the sublattice polarization and the Wilson loop are therefore unaffected. Uh, in this frozen band approximation by the remote bands. But as we saw, uh, the effect, uh, but they are actually affected by the remote bands. And so this effect is um, missed uh, in this frozen band approximation. Okay, so, um, so this is the end of stage two. And now we are in the final step, um, which is really the interesting part. Um, we have our effective theory for the narrow bands with renormalized uh, wave functions with Coulomb interactions. And we're going to try to solve that part in strong coupling. Now, Adolfo, can you tell me how much time I have left? Um, yeah, I think you started around maybe five minutes. <laughs> OK. Uh, yeah. Well, we were writing okay. quite late anyway. OK. So, so, so in this final step, uh, our goal is to um, then treat the Coulomb interaction as the dominant term, and that the bandwidth, the kinetic energy, the renormalized kinetic energy that will come in due to the RG as a perturbation. And we're going to try to check whether that's a sensible thing uh, to do um, at the very end. Now, there are different ways to treat this problem. You can treat this in momentum space, you can treat this in a hybrid Vanier basis, or you can treat this in 2D exponentially localized basis as we did uh, in this uh, uh, paper in 2019 with Gian. Um, uh, and despite the obstructions, you can actually gain a lot of insight into uh, the physics of the strong couple. In particular, as was shown in this paper, you can see why um, the anti-ferromagnetic super exchange fails. And in fact, why, why this problem is ferromagnetic uh, as opposed to anti-ferromagnetic. Um, now, um, in any case, the problem to be solved now is uh, we are left with Coulomb interactions projected onto the narrow bands. We're going to treat the renormalized kinetic energy as small and try to see what can one say uh, in this limit. So now, if we are at a charge neutrality point, then any many body state that is annihilated by delta rho is a ground state because the interaction is positive semi Um At even integer filling, uh, it turns out that the ground states uh, of this strong coupling limit um, are also many body eigenstates of this delta rho. Okay. Um, and this was shown. Uh, in, uh, in the full uh, problem numerically by uh, Andre's uh, group. And, uh, and then at odd integer filling, if the sublattice is perfectly polarized, so if we are in a chiral limit, 
then the churn states are ground states of this Hamilton. Now, so these are not the only ground states, however. Um, it um, turns out that this, so, so the, the big point here is that these generalized ferromagnets are favored by the projective Coulomb interaction. But these are not the only ground states. Um, there, there are states which um, are related by a global uh, spin valley rotation symmetry uh, to the states I just mentioned. And I guess, um, um, uh, I don't think I have enough time in this lecture uh, to discuss this spin valley U4 symmetry in the strong coupling limit. Um, let me just uh, maybe mention that the particle hole symmetry is key for establishing uh, this U4 uh, spin valley symmetry. Um, and maybe I just stop here and then continue with this uh, on the next lecture in the interest of time. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Oscar, for this very clear, uh, clear and very detailed uh, explanation. Um, so actually, there's a there's a, com a question on particle hole symmetry. Uh, how do the high energy degrees of freedom affect the particle hole symmetry for the flat bands? Okay. So. Um, I didn't discuss this, but uh, uh, it's a very good question, uh, but we can actually do that calculation in real time. So uh, let's see, let me go back to, so I presume that um, the question is about the terms which are omitted in the HBM. Let's see. Hey, here we go. So, so the term that breaks particle hole symmetry in HBM is due to the rotation in the business Megano model is due to the rotation of the Pauli matrix. Yeah. Now, one way to proceed is to uh, remove this uh, uh, rotation by unitary transformation simply by absorbing the phase into the top layer wave function. And then it's going to um, uh, rotate uh, this interlayered tunnel. Now, so um, the, the, the interlayered tunneling is now going to find itself uh, sandwiched um, in, uh, uh, in something like e to the i theta uh, uh, sigma z. Now, um, it contains two parts, the interlayered tunneling. There's a part which is sigma x and sigma y, and that anti-commutes through sigma z. So that part is unaffected. Now, the part that gets affected is the part that is proportional to identity. So that piece will now pick up a cosine of that small angle, and then we'll also pick up an I sine sigma Z of that small angle. So, in, so, so if we now go back to um, our actual calculation uh, here, uh, here, um, then this rotated interlayered tunneling matrix T will contain not just, um, oh, sorry, so it will contain not just identity sigma X and sigma Y, but it will also contains I sigma Z with a very small coefficient, sine of that small angle. So now we can just go through this calculation and we did this. So it's in a supplementary of our paper with Gian. And what you will discover is that now, um, uh, because sigma z anti-commutes through both, um, the second term actually does not vanish, but it adds up. So we will get a renormalization of that new term, let's call it W3, which comes from the rotation, due to Coulomb interaction, and it will grow. But when you check how much does it actually grow for realistic parameters, you can get about a factor of two enhancement of that term by the time you reach the narrow band. But it already starts out very small. It starts out sine of, it's down by a sine of uh, uh, one degree. So whether it's sine of one degree or two degrees, it's still small. So while particle hole symmetry um, uh, uh, is certainly broken, um, the leading term in the uh, uh, narrow bands will still be particle hole symmetric. And then this term should now be treated as a perturbation. So hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, 
Um, I think the next question is by Andre. Uh, you can unmute yourself. Oh, yes, sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah I did this right for once. Um, so uh, I have a question about uh, um, the well, very interesting um, RG. So in effect, I'm thinking that this, the Wilson loop is actually telling you that in RG, the gap between the um, flat and uh, passive bands is growing. Is that true? Right. I think I think it's true. Uh, you can see that actually in the little movie that I read for stage two. Right. Uh, yeah, I think it, I, I I think this makes it very clear actually. So it's very nice. Yeah. Here. So you see that band is indeed growing. I mean, the gap is indeed growing. The the remote bands are moving up. Right, and this this flattening and winding, this flattening of the Wilson loop that you get at large W zero over W, is basically due to the fact that the most of the Berry curvature is concentrated around. Right, the, the gap is yeah. low at the gamma point, and most of it is concentrated there. Is that right? That's the picture right. you have. Yep, that's right. Okay, I see. Okay, it's it's. Do you understand why it's so? I guess at zero point eight, the gap is not the smallest, right? The gap is the smallest at, at the isotropic point. The gap between the uh, passive band and the uh, active bands, right? Then it closes, right? Right. So, so, but I, but it, it seems like it's very flat. It's flatter at. Oh, I see. Point some eight. monotonic behavior, roughly. Yeah. I no, I don't understand why it's a mono, non-monotonic. I see. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. And there's a time for one more question, but if not, uh, I mean, I don't see any other question. Um, so thanks, uh, Oscar. Very, uh, very nice talk. Looking for forward to your next lecture. And I think we can reconvene in uh, 15 minutes, uh, maybe so 10 past wherever you are, and um, and see you all there for the last uh, lecture of. The
and see it. Andre, are you here? Oh, we're currently waiting to see if Andre is <laughs> here. Oh, hi. Sorry. Ah, hi, there you go. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah you can... No, no, no problem. Can you start sharing screen? Uh, yes. Sorry. Okay. So I, I can, you know, monitor the Q&A, but if you want to share yourself as you've been doing, it's also totally fine. Um, no, no, I love, uh, <laughs> I love your monitoring. Thanks for me. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll interrupt you when I see questions. Um, okay. okay. Great, so thanks again for, uh, for being here and agreeing for uh, to give uh, these lectures. They've been very, very instructive. And so today we are giving your last uh, lectures, but so we're looking forward uh, to that. And yeah, the floor is yours. Thanks. Okay, fantastic. So I uh, want to um, um, kind of clarify, not clarify, but uh, add a reference. Yesterday, I forgot to say that this non-trivial topology bound, which is basically the bound from below um, of the superfluid weight that was done in BDG by the first row of, uh, of people starting with a Finnish group um, was actually shown to be um, um, not only a BDG property by uh, Monte Carlo, by Perry et al, to be basically in a fully interacting um, 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 non-mean field uh, model. Okay, so I want to say that and then um, we stopped kind of here, where I showed you that there's a mapping between the eigenvalues on the L lattice, those on the, uh, or the orbitals on the L lattice, the orbitals on the L tilde lattice. Um, in order to have flat bands, you need the orbitals on the L lattice to be larger, number of them to be larger than the orbitals on the L tilde lattice. And there's a one-to-one -one mapping between just the orbital content of the L and L tilde lattices and um, um, the flat band um, eigenvalues at the high symmetry points, which in turn for um, certain symmetry groups um, give the topology character. So if the topology character is given by the eigenvalues, you're gonna know it. Um, and I remind you that this basically this equivalence tells you that the symmetries that the symmetry eigenvalues of the flat bands at high symmetry points which is this b vector um the b vector will tell you that you have a you know whatever representation you have um, um here here and here is basically just given by the difference between the representation of high symmetry points of the orbitals on the L lattice, which you know, because you know, these are just the uh, atomic limits of these orbitals, the elementary band representation, and those on the L tilde lattice, which you also know, okay? And because of this minus sign, 
um, then you have a, basically a kind of a natural way of understanding why flat bands in general um, or exact flat bands are likely to be topological, at least for, you know, uh, if you don't have a large number of orbitals. Okay. So now there was a question yesterday, which I uh, um, um, delegated to this uh, side of the, to, to, to today's talk, uh, that you can get the degeneracy points between flat bands and the, um, the um, some dispersive bands by this, by this um, strategy. And the answer is of course, yes. Um, now in the past, um, you know, there were some theorems that, you know, for example, there's a famous theorem, I'm not sure if by Milke, I think it's by Milke, that the line graph of a bipartite lattice has um, um, degeneracy points between the flat band and, um, um, and the uh, dispersive band. Now the line graph, as we know now, after uh, this talk is basically just, the line graph is basically just, um, you know, an integration of one of the lattice in this S orbital construction. If I take this in this S matrix construction, if I take this S matrix construction with this Hamiltonian integrate one of the lattices, I obtain the line graph lattice. And, and um, there's, as I said, this theorem by Milke basically says that um, the line graph of bipartite lattice has to have, uh, well, first of all, has to have flat band because um, <clears throat> it does, and we can understand it from this, the S matrix, but also has to have the degeneracy points with the, um, with the, um, well, with the um, um, dispersive bands. But in fact, not on this, you know, this is a sufficient, um, requirement that you have a line graph for a bipartite lattice, but it's not necessary. So this formalism, I reclaim encompasses cases that, you know, are not uh, picked up by the bipartite um, uh, theorem, um, which is restricted in the sense that it's valid for line graphs of, so for a subset of these um, lattices. Okay, so let's see how you can get the dispersive node, mode, the dispersive, uh, to flat band degeneracy points. So first let's look to the left. This is no, there's no dispersive to flat band degeneracy, but basically you can see, you know, the appearance of a flat band in a non chiral symmetric energy symmetric system, um, et cetera. And, and this is a line graph. This is a, sorry, not a line graph, but an S matrix construction of S orbitals on the L lattice, which shop, you know, mid bond here between, um, between um, um, S orbitals, for example, on the L tilde lattice, which are the red ones here, which are the, the at the corners of the um, um, triangles, okay? And of course you have two atoms here, you have one atom here, you're going to get one flat band Okay, this is the one flat band that you're going to get. And how do we find out its, its representation of isometry points? Well, you know, these are AS orbitals, okay, at uh, what's called the 3F three, three, uh, weak opposition, okay? And um, these are um, the, the uh, S orbitals at the uh, 1A weak opposition, okay? So these are these ones, okay? And and then you can, let's do it, okay, like these three, for example. And then um, then you go to the Bilbao Star Graphic Server and you find out this, the, you know, the representation is called AG. This is the EBR of these. This is the EBR of the elementary band representation of, the or the atomic limit elementary band representation is um, you know Zach um, um, Zach talk for atomic limits um, and um, and 
you know, you can have them tabulated now with the Microsoft Graphics Server, and you take this difference and you find these eigenvalues. Okay. And then any model you're going to build that has this S major construction, you can put in next nearest neighbor hoppings. You can put in any types of hoppings you want. Okay. You're going to get this flat band and it's going to have the same eigenvalues. The dispersion is going to be a bit different, but it's going to have the same eigenvalues. Okay. Now to the to the to the right, we um, now have a model where I have, you know, three S orbitals, one at each of the um, threefold wake-up positions. These are basically the Kagame positions. Okay, here the 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 um, um, the black dots, okay, these guys, and the L tilde lattice is is an S orbital at the hexagonal at the graphene position, okay. So now you're going to have how many flat bands? Where you're going to have three minus two, one flat band. You know, whereas here you had two of them, okay. They were they were degenerate. Here you have one flat band, okay, and and you want to find out its eigenvalues at the high symmetry points. And what you do is again you do the subtraction, the subtraction, and this subtraction, you go on the Bulbark Crystal Graphic Server, you find this guy, again, and you find um, this represent sorry this this CBR of the of the um, of the S orbital at the um, uh, C2 T, C2 symmetric quick opposition. So the 3F, the black dots minus the EBR of the S orbital at the C3 symmetric position, uh, which, is, um, which is the hexagonal position here. Um, um, and you take their difference, just need to delete to refresh the screen. Okay, and then what you find, if you take this difference, what you find is that, you know, this difference in momentum space, this has some representation in momentum space. They're tabulated at the elementary band representation function of the Microsoft Graphic Server. This is another, sorry, this is another, um, another um, representation in momentum space. You can take their difference and you find out that at the K point, you have a K1 representation. At the end point, you have an M3 minus representation. You know, this is the one, this is a one-dimensional representation. You know, um, it's got to be the C3 eigenvalue one representation. Okay. And this is M3 minus representation, uh, C, C2 eigenvalue minus. Okay. But then you find that at the gamma point, you can't take the difference. Okay. In other words, at the gamma point, if I did the flat band, if I wanted, if I did the flat band vector by this formula, that I gave you before, I find a contradiction at the gamma point. I find that you know the gamma point representations would be gamma five plus minus gamma four minus. These are two different representations of the of the symmetry um, of the local you know point group at momentum at the at the gamma point is the point group of the lattice also. Okay, so these are. Uh, two different representations, and I find out that if I take this minus, I obtain this. Okay, gamma five plus minus gamma four minus. But there's no meaning in a minus in terms of representations. Okay, um, so this means that there's no way here to completely separate the flat band from another band. Okay, so this actually means that here I have not a flat at the gamma point, not a flat band separated, okay, but um, a flat band that is connected to another band that provides this gamma four representation so that you don't have to take a minus, which doesn't mean anything, okay. So this representation at the gamma point is actually gamma five plus, okay, it's a two dimensional representation, it's gamma five plus, and the you can write the flat band as gamma five plus, okay, K, K1, 
representations m3 minus okay and in this case this is one dimensional this is one dimensional this is two dimensional so you know that the flat band has a generacy point with a dispersive band okay um and that's the way you get you get all the generacy points that you want on the lattice so by starting with n and l tilde I also not only can establish the topology if the bands can be separated. So if if I don't have the situation with minus sign at a particular point in the case space, I can find the topology. If um, um, the bands, if I if the such a situation arises where by taking this. Uh, atomic limit difference between the L and L tilde lattice, if the situation arises that I have a difference of representations like gamma five plus minus gamma four minus, uh, then it means that I cannot, um, you know, well, that would be nonsensical to like, to say that this is a one dimensional representation because of difference um, and states have to come in sums of representations at high symmetry points uh, in the Brian zone. And that means that I have a generacy point. Okay, so I hope that's clear. If it's not clear, please ask questions. So now you have a one-to-one -one mapping between, not a one, again, I keep saying one-to-one, -one. it's not a one-to-one -one mapping, it's an orbital. Once you know the orbitals on the N and L tilde lattice, you can get the topology or the, or the, um, or the, um, uh, the generacy points of the flat band, but, there are, you know, many L and L tilde, different L and L tilde lattices that can give you the same, the same flat band and the same uh, jumpsy points. Okay, so now I want to basically point out that that this this um, um, you know graphing model, for example, twisted bilayer model, that was ten band model that was done by Poe at et al by breaking particle hole. Symmetry, actually, you can understand it also um, by a flat band, by an S matrix construction. And, you know, the L and L tilde lattices are basically just given by these, these lattices. Okay, these are the L, these are the L tilde lattices. Question? Yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, Mikel Garcia, uh, what is the robustness of the flat band against longer range hoppings? There is. 100% robustness as long as you have your Hamiltonian is this, okay? Or your Hamiltonian is this. Notice I didn't tell you what S of K is, okay? It can be any hoppings, any orbitals. It's 100% robust. You can, can have any hoppings, any orbitals. It's gonna be an exact flat band. Um, so that's a very good question. So, you know, normally if I wanted to start from a Kagome, Okay, so if I cover me with nearest neighbor couplings has a flat band. If I add arbitrarily on the Kagome next nearest neighbor couplings, I mess up the flat band. Okay, because, because you haven't added it properly. The proper way to add it in the Kagome lattice is to start, if you want to add the next nearest, next nearest neighbor hoppings, is you start with the hexagonal lattice. Okay, the hexagonal lattice and the Kagome sites. Okay, these are the Kagome sites. It's a five band model. This would be um, um, three, this would be two. Okay, um, then you integrate out the, the, um, the hexagonal lattice. And then you can add any type of S, any type, any long range hopping as you want. So you can recover the flat band of the Kagome for some, you know, ratios of longer range hoppings. But if you just add it directly in the Kagome, you want the next longer range hoppings will spoil the, the flat band. But that's the wrong way to add it, is what I claim. The right way to add it is to build this five band model and then integrate out the L tilde lattice, and then you get the Kagome model, which can have longer range hoppings if you want to, but they will come out this of this integration. So they'll have some properties of themselves, um, such as 
the tails or whatever, whatever you'll, you'll get. But this construction by itself, which is, I claim the, the or we claim the, the, the way to, to go about building flat bands, um, doesn't care about how many hoppings, the, the range of the hoppings. It's a very good question. Thank you. OK. Thanks. OK, very good. So for example, the PO, this PO uh, model, um, a 10 band model of twisted bilayer, again, as I said, can be expressed as an S matrix with the L lattice being this, the L tilde lattice being this. OK. And then there's some theory, which I'll go, you know, I'm basically just going to quote the results. It's not, you know, particularly illuminating, but um, um, you can kind of have a set of generators for the flat bands, for gap flat bands and gapped and gapless flat bands. So there's an infinite number of them, but there's a set of generators. Okay, so um, so then you know once you have this 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 theory, well, what are you going to do with it? Um, and the immediate you know thing to do with it is since um, you know our um, collaborators such as uh, Bradley Kano, Koro Vernyori Wang, it's it all, or in more recent papers, Vernyori Wang, Renyo, and Vernyori Bidder, Renyo build this extensive database of materials. So you know, this, this now it contains about 70 to 80,000 materials. Um, and you know their topology and you know moreover topology of each set of separate bands that you can take. Now, you know, this might not be particularly illuminating for a system that has a lot of spaghetti of bands here, but for systems, you know, for systems that are, you know, 10,000 of them out of the 70,000, which have um, uh, bands that are not spaghetti, this is, uh, it could be very useful. But even, but you can take all these 70K materials and um, try to find flat bands in um, um, these materials. And, you know, this is again, the reason why I, uh, I wanted to underline these, uh, these people who've worked uh, tremendously hard on getting these, uh, these, um, um, these results out. Okay, so there's two things you can do. So one thing you can do is you can find flat bands by brute force. And the way you find flat band by brute force is just putting a flat band filter on this database, which basically means that um, uh, what you're doing is, you know, you're asking, you're putting some criteria. So you have a database and you add some criteria to it. And these are the criteria that we've added. You know, you build the length, you basically ask for um, um, the bands to be, uh, flatter on a length L, which is at least, you know, one uh, high symmetry line in the Brian zone. Um, you know, you can sorry, you can give them a score, how how high, how you know, how many, how many, um, what's the flat band score? How many basically, roughly, how many lines around the Brian zone um, they're flat on, and then you can ask. You know several things such as um, ask um, to get the bands that are flat within um, and end within one electron volt of the Fermi level. Um, you can change this to half an electron volt, etc. And you can ask for the flatness of the bands to be, uh, you know, roughly. In our case, we put fifty mean electron field fifty mean electron volts now. You know, this is kind of an arbitrary number since we don't have an estimate of the interactions in these bands. But you know, it's you can pick your value, and in fact, in the website that that uh, we've built for this, uh, you can actually change these numbers and you know find different uh, things. Um, just be patient with the website because it's loading things live, so it's actually not very fast. So you might think it's not working, like, but it is working. It's just you just have to, you just have to have kind of a Spartan attitude and play with it for 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 a while, and it'll work. It's just 
It's just not very fast because it's loading a lot of information, uh, such as information such as density of states also. And this is another way to just brute force get these, um, these systems. For example, you know, you look for peaks, peaks that are larger than, you know, the average uh, or smaller width than the average, etc. at the Fermi level. Okay, so you do this and you do this brute force and um, you find uh, the following the following um, um, number of materials um, that you can then go to them one by one by hand. And so that obviously takes some time um, and curate them. So there's, there's, you know, flat atomic bands, nice flat atomic bands. There's at the Fermi level, there's, so th I, I remind you this out of 70K, 70K materials, 70K number of materials, non-atomic flat bands, there's this number. And then you can, you know, go through all of them by eye and try to, you know, still uh, use the best machine learning um, that we have, which is the brain, I guess, uh, and and come up with a curated curated list of materials, which is not that large a number. Okay, so that's one way. That's the brute force way. The other way. Um, before we go to the other way, there's a question. Yeah. Um, okay. Question on the effect of hopping from sites of the same sublattice. If we did not ignore them completely, what could be their effect? That's a very good question again. Um, notice here that there's in the L tilde sublattice, they don't matter. Okay, so B of K is hoppings between the L tilde and L tilde. So they don't matter. As long as these conditions are satisfied, these conditions are satisfied. Okay, so for example, here, in this case, where A, A is a complete constant. So this condition is now, this is one of the Hamiltonians that satisfy the conditions I put on, on, on the previous page that um, um, Kaluga and Chu found. But basically in this, you can see this, this a is constant. So if I have this, there's no, um, there's no restriction on S of K and B of K. Okay. So that's, I think that that answers the question. Very good question. So you can, you can have, now, if I had coupling within here, within, you know, any Hamiltonian, any Hamiltonian can be expressed like this. Okay. Any Hamiltonian can be expressed like this if I don't have any restrictions. So obviously not every Hamiltonian has flat bands. Flat bands are very specific. So these conditions are important, which are basically conditions on this A of K, okay? So if I start messing here in this simpler case with A of K, I'll de-flatten the bands and their bandwidth will basically be proportional to how much I mess up the flatness of the A of K. So basically I, cannot have a lot of hopping in the L sublattice, but I can have a lot of hopping in the L tilde sublattice, in fact, any type of hopping. There's Good. a, a follow-up question. What is the meaning of best flat bands? Yeah, that's a, also a good question. And, you know, it's also, you know, the answer to this I would give is the answer to what's the meaning of the of the of the of the word best that's also in the eye of the beholder you know so for example for example i would say this band is pretty good okay because but it's not the best it's pretty good because it's got you know you have a flat band over everything but it's not the best because you know you have it doesn't stay flat here you have a lot of crap coming here it's like basically it's good it's it's good but it's not the best now things like this, okay, like this one, which, you know, basically, I mean, well, not basically, clearly independently found by Tchaikovsky and because he's also done the experiment um, while we were um, um, writing this paper. This one's also very good. It's actually probably better than the one before because it's flatter on a longer part of the Brian zone, okay, this guy. 
So you can see there's basically an anti-crossing here. This is longer on a lar lar larger part of the Brian zone. There's still kind of some spaghetti of bands here, but it's a little bit better than the one before. Now, you know, these ones are, you know, also good. Uh, this one, there's a lot more spaghetti. This one in uh, magne uh, uh, um, Magnize uh, uh, 6. Let's see this. Which one is... Let me just give you some other examples. Okay. But these ones, okay, but these ones which are curated, these ones are really good. Okay. I'm not sure if really good means physically many body interesting, but it certainly means that they're very good in the sense that they're flat over a large region of the Brian zone. Like look at this one here. Okay. And um, there's not a spaghetti of bands around them. Okay. So that I would say is really good. This is really good. So these are ones. So you know that's what I mean. That basically we did some curation by hand. You know this one is really good. You can see it here, as I'll show you. I'll I'll, I'll get back to these later. But I think it's maybe it's important to have this uh, discussion, even if it breaks the flow of the talk. Um, this one is really good. You'd have nothing around it. Um, so. So, you know, that's why you still need like the human eye to go through them. So, that's all. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I, I can read the. I can read the. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, I, go ahead. Yeah. It's okay. Some from Mikkel, which is the most way of containing friends with particular. Oh, ooh, okay. So that's, so, so there's no efficient way for the public to do that now. So it's not on the website, okay? Um, just because it's not, it's not easy. I mean, you know, you, have, you can have a lot of bands uh, um, somewhere on the website tells you, you know, you have a flat band around the, amongst those bands but you know, following that flat band, especially if there's anti-crossings, it's not that easy. So there's no particular way for you to do that now. Uh, um, we can probably do it internally, but it, it's, it's not implemented at the moment and, um, and it's not easy. So one, one, the way one would do it is of course to go through, you know, you can do it, it just would not be efficient. So you can go through these 345 unique materials, okay? For example, uh, if you have for this best flat band, if you want, okay? Each of them has the flat band. Then you can go on the topologicalquantumchemistry.com website and find that flat band. Also on that website are given the representations of all the bands from the, from the core shells to the highest bands that, the uh, highest orbitals that we took, you know, I guess it's 10, as Maya would know better, plus or minus 10, uh, plus or minus 20 bands it's below and above the Fermi level, something like this, okay? But, so you can go and do this, you can, so you, then you can count, you know, you can see which one the flat band is, you can count from up and do it. So you can, send, you know, if you, if, you, if, you have, if you have one material that you're really interested in, that can be done. To do this for 345 by hand is not easy. But the information is there, is there to search for, to find the representation of a particular material. If you want to do it the other way, to call all the materials that have the specific representations, that's not done. And we don't plan to put it, to do it even internally. Okay, the next question. Is there a one-to-one -one relation where all the elementary slides can be written with those conditions in the FK only only works in one direction. So um, that's a very good question. So in, in fact, what you're asking is, is this method complete? So the question is, is there a one-to-one -one relation where all the systems with flat bands can be written with those conditions in FK, those conditions meaning the degeneracy of AFK or it only works in one direction. So it certainly works in one direction. Um, if AFK has those conditions, will you have flat bands but not otherwise, right? So you're asking if basically the list, list is complete, okay? So the question, so the answer that I can give you is that the list should be complete 
without particle hole symmetry. You can obviously have, so if I have particle hole symmetry, there's another way of building flat bands, which is particle hole symmetry, which changes K to minus K, okay? Change goes, K goes to minus K, but then you add inversion. So if I have inversion times particle hole symmetry, then this changes K to K and would take energy to minus energy. So if I have an odd number of bands, I have to have a flat band, okay? But particle hole is not a crystallographic symmetry. It won't appear in most materials, okay? You know, there's, you can do some theory where you can have flat Bogoliubov bands with this, then, you know, but, but it won't be of interest experimentally, I think. Um, so inversion times particle hole will, can get you flat bands. Um, and Kalugur and Chu basically also looked at it, uh, but didn't, didn't uh, publish this. But basically, um, it's, not, it's not relevant for materials in quantum chemistry because particle doesn't appear in most situations in the real material. And whereas this bipartite type of lattice that we have, uh, that you have appears because for example, you know, if I have Leibniz model, this condition would only tell you that you don't get coupling between these, okay? This AFK condition, but, and the only hopping is between the dot and the X. But, you know, that's a physical condition because the distance between these two is square root of two, okay? The distance between these two, okay? So hopping is going exponentially with the, say, the square of the distance. This is e to the minus two, at least, the hopping between these orbitals. Not looking at any symmetry is at least e to the minus two times the hopping of these orbitals. That's a good, that's a physical condition, okay? That can appear in physical materials. Whereas, so I claim that it's, it's a one-to-one -one relation if you don't include particle hole. You can write everything like that, okay? Um, the next question is when looking at the real materials, is the unique, is it unique the identification of N, L, and L tilde sublet? So I'll get to this right now. Um, there are some situations where it's unique. There are some situations where it's approximate. It's a, also a very good question. So, um, so I'll get to this um, now. Very good. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay. So I spoke about the, the, the brute force way, but of course, as Inigo was asking and anticipating basically um, the next slide, uh, what we actually want to do is to use all this, you know, to complement the brute force way with the, with the uh, non-brute force way with the, this line graph, uh, with the, not line graph, but bipartite SFK method. And basically we started looking for all the lattices that can have a bipartite um, structure and um, a bipartite structure of the relevant orbitals. So if you have a atom, for example, which is not in a bipartite structure, we wanted to have the, or the relevant orbitals at a far different energy than the energy or than the energy of the active orbitals, okay? Okay, so you can devise a method that looks for this, okay? And, and that method has, you know, has, you can look at it in two ways. You can find a supergroup method, which is what was asked before, which is based on symmetry, on, on basically symmetry of graphs. And you can, you know, you can, see if a set of coordinates, okay, belongs to a lattice that forms, for example, a bipartite lattice or a line graph lattice, that you can see an exact one. You can see by, by symmetry. So for example, some symmetry groups like C6V in some planes, right? C6V, which would be a plane in three dimensions would be a plane symmetry group. You can, you can, you know, this supports Kagome lattices if the atoms are in some weak opposition. Okay, so you can do a search based on that. You can ask in all the symmetry groups on 
any planes, they can do first a 2D search. On any planes, do I get a lattice that's that's bipartite or that's Kagome or that's a line graph uh, or that's a split graph, which are all included in that, in the in this S matrix formalism. So you can do that. Then you can ask, you know, do I have any pure 3D um, 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 3D lattices? And clearly by just looking at Wyckoff positions, okay, you can um, see what you have bipartite lattices with larger number of electrons. So basically, you know, in this in the square lattice, the simplest way is to realize, you know, if I wanted to, if I didn't know anything, of course, in the square lattice, it's very easy to do it by I. But if I didn't want to do it by I, I would just ask, you know, are there two wick positions where one of them is connected from the other and the distance between one and the other, you know, are the, are the two equal positions, one of them with a higher multiplicity than the other? The answer is yes, I have a two multiplicity and a one multiplicity here. And then I would say, well, and the distance between the two weak positions that have the higher multiplicity is larger than the distance between the weak opposition uh, of the higher multiplicity and one lower multiplicity. And then I do another check, okay? So you can automate this process. So then this will give you this lattice. So you can do another, so you can automate this process basically. There's another question. What will be the effect of the flat bands on the car anomaly in the case of the valve symmetry will manifest itself in the transfer measurements? So, so um, that's a question that's far off what I'm talking about right now. So I'm not going to answer it right now. Okay, you can keep it live, and if we have time at the end, I'll answer it at the end. But I want to keep concentrating on what I'm going to talk about it now or, or the subject of this talk, okay? This is not an experimental um, a talk, so um, I'll try to answer it the best as I can at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the, um, of the, of the talk. Thanks. We, we can keep it live. Okay, so then you can find a also, you know, a... Um, geometric method which basically tells you well you know say i have some sort of a some sort of an approximate you know some sort of a symmetry some sort of a lattice where these are not you know these things are not uh, uh, mid bond there's there's some somehow they're a little bit further away or you know some some symmetry is broken so you don't have exactly c4 and and ask if there's approximate bipartite structure, approximate Kagome. So you can say, you know, we have the Kagome, but I don't have, you know, I don't have the correct um, uh, symmetry group. You know, this is the whatever. I don't have the correct symmetry group. So you know, this distance is a little bit higher than this, and a little bit. Um, higher than this, okay? So I have like Kagome triangles, which are a little bit distorted, okay? So you can sort of still find that it's, that it's, um, you can still find that there, there's, there's, there's gonna be a Kagome structure, but it's just approximate. So you can devise obviously geometric methods to look for these type of situations. And what you find is that in all these materials, there's, so there's 70,000, I think between 70 and, shit, sorry, between 70 and um, 70,000 and 90,000, I'm not remembering exactly. There's also how many materials are du duplicates, etc. cetera, okay? Um, there's between these uh, and number of materials, and you find out that there's, these types, these these number of materials with Kagome lattices on on Li basically means bipartite, okay, and these uh, many of pyrochlor, and then you find also there's some approximate numbers of symmetries, okay. There's a lot of them, okay, and you know these are some way some 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 things. To try on automated identification, I'm not going to go through it because it's just basically computer, uh, um, just just computer searching 
through through the types of lattices that we can get. Okay. Um, but all these and then kind of cross check them. Okay, with you can cross check if the materials you found by brute force kind of cross check with these materials that you found uh, that you found uh, with you know these 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 the materials you found that have these lattices, and the answer is yes, they do cross check. There's a high degree of correlation. Um, and you can, of course, then build a database, which is which you can find it um, here, where you can have you know you can have all these features that you can look for uh, a flat band, and you can even look for the lattice features, which materials have the lattice. So you can play around and find out. Again, it's very slow, so really playing around doesn't work, uh, but playing around with the purpose does work. Okay. Okay. So for example. Let's give the the this example of this material, which is a very clean one with a I mean clean flat band. So you can see a huge density of states, huge large flat band, non non um, non atomic. It cannot be atomic. It's got these huge dispersive that's coming out of it. Okay, um, um, etc. And then and then you know you have several several atoms in it. And then the website basically tells you, well, it tells you the, um, um, you know, if it's known to be magnetic and it's not known to be magnetic, if it's known to be superconducting and it's not known to, it's not known or unknown. So basically there's no information. Unknown means no information. Uh, but, um, and again, this information comes from, a Japanese database of superconducting materials. Um, the magnetic properties come from the material project. Okay, and then you get you know a lot of information like the band structure, the you know the topological topological uh, um, um, character. If you go if you go here on the topological database, and then um, you know this belongs to the flat band list, and then you get basically also uh, information about what happens um, um, when, you know, which atoms uh, form sublattices. For example, these atoms, okay, on some middle indices planes form a Kagome sublattice. These atoms on middle indices planes form a Kagome sublattice, okay? Okay, and then you know you can find out that this has also bipartite sublattices, not just Kagome, okay, etc. And you can find all this information um, here uh, on this on this website. Okay, so these are several of the materials that um, are, you know, that we showcased. Um, now, basically, what you can also do, and we did for these materials, you can do, so they all have these type of, of, of S matrix constructions, but you can, what you can do is you can do a ab initio vanierization of the, of the Hamiltonian of these materials, and you can find the Hamiltonian without any input, just by brute force. And then remarkably, what you find is that the Hamiltonian basically is of this form out of the vanier states, you know, and then some A here, and then some B of K. Okay, and this is just kind of a brute force calculation that goes the other way without knowing anything. You basically are proving that, um, you know, there was the question of whether all, you know, whether this construction is complete. And, you know, this is kind of a, this is basically a check on the statement that, um, that I believe it is complete. Um, um, all these materials, if you just do brute force ab initio, will spit out a Vanya Hamiltonian, a Vanya type binding Hamiltonian that looks like this. Again, this is another question. And you got to have flat bands, you need to have constant eigenvalue on the L sub lattice. How necessary is to have really flat bands? How necessary is this to have really flat bands? How can you check this on a real material? Well, again, it's, you know, it's necessary to have exact flat bands. Now, you know, to have re depends what you mean by really flat. Okay, it's again a semantics question. Any perturbation you're going to have to a to the constant eigenvalue on the L sub lattice will 
mess up your flat bands. Uh, if the perturbation is larger, you mess them up more. If it's not larger, you'll mess them up less. Um, how can you check this on, on a real material? Well, as I said, the way we check it is, um, or maybe I didn't say it um, um, well enough, but the way we check it is, for example, we, we look at the bipartite sublattices. I gave you this, this example, which is the simplest one you can visualize. We look at the bipartite sublattices, for example, that's one way. Then we ask, what's the distance between these atoms and the distance between these atoms, okay? And then we put a cutoff to that distance and we neglect all the ones where this distance is smaller than a cutoff off because we want this is the distance that will govern the L sub lattice hopping. Okay, so you can do this in a in an automated way. Of course, you know, there's a lot of background to this that's kind of like not not relayed by me now, but you know, this takes a while. You have, you know, you have to look into different different cutoffs, you have to make sure you're not missing things, you look back, you test some things. You talk to uh, people that know uh, experimentally some flat bands. You ask them if you know to give you some like Joe Kelsey to give you some materials. Then you find, um, you know, you see if you've missed those, etc. So there's a lot of back and forth in to optimize these cutoffs that you're using. But basically, the the, the strategy is is that it's geometric to look for for. Uh, to, to, to see whether, you know, this A, this constant eigenvalue on the A sub lattice exists. Basically looking for low hoppings on that lattice. Very good question. Okay. So, um, right, okay. So all these, so for all these materials, as I said, if you do the brute force, get, uh, answer this question. There's another question I'll answer it uh, after the next slide. Uh, you get a correct uh, S matrix construction. Okay, so for example, um, these are the ones that um, I wanted to 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 show you. But there's 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 as I said, 345 or 340 of the ones that that we've curated. Now the website contains thousands of them because they're also the ones that are not the best. You're going to see in a lot of them some spaghetti of bands. Uh, okay. But um, the reason why I find these more interesting is, uh, and that might not be the case, it might not be the case that they're the most interesting. It might be the case that the other ones are um, uh, interesting, is that they're tagged as non-magnetic. So the materials project tags them as non-magnetic. So normally these guys uh, are not known, even though they have flat bands at the Fermi level. For example, this one it says exact, has it exactly at the Fermi level, okay? Um, they're not known to magnetize. And hence, maybe some other order, normally they should magnetize. There's some other order developing. Even for the ones that magnetize, which is here, it would have a ticker M, which would be magnetic. Even for the ones that magnetize, those ones that magnetize, since these bands, we've only looked at bands which are non-atomic, flat bands which are non-atomic. If you look at flat bands that are atomic, there's another, there's other lists. By the way, the flat bands that are atomic are also included on the website, but the ones that we showcase, none of them are atomic. So they shouldn't be atomic. So if you polarize them, if you magnetize them, similar things should happen as Oscar said in Twisted Bilayer, the topology of the underlying band should imprint in topology of the many body state. Okay. So, so um, even the magnetic ones, I think are very interesting. And, um, and basically we're waiting for experiments. Okay. And I think I'm going to stop here. And I wanted to talk a little bit about interactions in TBG, uh, especially about the charge two um, uh, excitation, and basically to show you how this the topology of the flat beds in, gets imprinted in the charge to excitations, but I've run out of time. So um, 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 uh, I basically, um, um, Oscar is going to talk about this. So uh, listen to those talks carefully because um, all of this will be covered there. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Andre. Um, 
Well, you did start a bit later, uh, so I don't know how long would that take you. Um, yeah, it's probably going to take me a while. I, I like to to do to actually do anything, anything, um, anything meaningful is going to take me a while. And I know Oscar is going to talk about the charge one excitation, um, which mm. which can take a little bit, but um, but yeah. So basically, there's a lot of overlap. So I think I think it's better to just stop here. Okay. Okay. So. What is the effect of SSC in this particular Vani Hamiltonian? Which particular Vani Hamiltonian? There's a question. What is the effect of SSC in this particular Vani Hamiltonian? What was the particular Vani Hamiltonian? If you could write again. Yeah, you can type it uh, below the question. Actually, for the first one, uh, maybe I have a suggestion, which is uh, so Claudia is going to give a talk. And maybe, maybe that's a question for Claudia. Uh, as well, how this um, flat bands affect the car anomaly? How would you expect it? Yeah, I mean, you can take yeah, your good. text. Point. Yeah. yeah, that's a good suggestion because my answer to that is I don't know. So both, so I know that Zahid Hassan claims that flat bands are very important. Um, okay, I just listened to one of his talks four days ago where he was basically claiming the flat bands are very very important um but i don't know more details so the answer is i don't know but maybe if some can, some other, some other of the panelists knows that also maybe you know I, I can i can say something uh, i mean i don't know about this particular material i haven't really looked at uh, how the flat band kind of interplays with the rest of the band structure but in uh cobalt silicon and and rhodium silicon also materials that uh you guys uh, predicted as multifold uh, semi-metals. Mm -hmm. You have you have a basically charge two crossing with three bands without spin rate coupling, and you have a flat band crossing in the middle. And if you if you look at the Landau levels, which I think you also calculated, uh, uh, you see that there are basically two Carroll Landau levels, and you still get a Carroll anomaly with those, even with a flat band in the middle. You would, in principle, still uh, no matter where you put the chemical potential, you you would count the number of Carroll Landau levels that you have, and you would have in that case too, and and you would still have a Carroll anomaly. Uh, but maybe in this material, things are more complicated because it's also magnetic. So. I see. So 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 that flat band. So yes. Yeah, so so you're right. So that flat band uh, in the middle does belong to this. You, you think it's the same flat band as this? That would be. That's very. That would be very neat. You're saying it's the same flat band, basically. Uh, possibly, possibly. <laughs> but, no, that would be kind of. I, I don't know, but yeah, I don't know. Very, that, yeah, that well it was very flat. I agree. Okay. Yeah, that would be very neat. Okay, very good. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. But yeah, but I I would okay. suggest to keep that question also for for Claudia I think next Thursday uh, and tomorrow, but following Thursday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the answer, so the second question was, what is the effect of SOC in this particular Vani Hamiltonian? The Hamiltonian was A of K. Okay, so again, SOC is included. This this construction includes SOC. Doesn't have anything to do with SOC. No SOC. This thing, A of K, S of K, B of K can have SOC, cannot have SOC. Whatever you want. Okay. And the Hamiltonian, um, you know, with SOC, the S of K is going to look a bit different than the S of, S of K without SOC. But you, this construction does not depend on whether you have SOC or not. I mean, that's kind of that's so so so. I know that in the literature, all the flat bands that we know, or most of them, are with you know SO are without SOC and S they're only with S orbitals, and that you know there's only you know, there's only examples, scatter examples of flat bands without SOC, but that's a historical kind of reason, the historical reason is that the flat band people are all graph theory people, okay? And they were just doing graphs, but but it doesn't matter. This, this you know, you, you don't need to sacrifice any SOC. This S of K and A of K and B of K can include SOC and the Vanier, Hamiltonian uh, that we obtained from Ab initio certainly does include SOC, and it, it's it 
because then it's this storm, this form. Okay, there's a question, how do you identify which flat vents from Martin? Why do you identify which flat vents are atomic? Uh, good question. Okay, so let me show you how you identify. For example, you look at this. Okay, so number one, the way you identify it is so you you have the you have the the website and you know it's eigenvalues at high symmetry points. Okay. So you first check that the eigenvalues of high symmetry points are compatible, are those of an atomic band. If they're not, it's topological. But you first check that those eigenvalues are those of an atomic uh, band. Okay, you, you found a flat band. And if they're those of an atomic band, then it's compatible with an atomic limit. And then, you know, you look, for example, at the distance of the lattice. If the distance is too large, then again, you know, you've got an atomic limit. Then you look at this gap. This gap is one electron volt, okay? There's no way you can get such a large gap in a topological system because they're usually spin orbit coupling gaps and largest ones are 300, 400 electron volts. That's, and there's only a couple of materials, bismuth selenite with those type of gaps, okay? Um, so that's, so these things you can do without running, of course, in order to fully prove it, you know, you'd have to run a Vanya, Vanya rice calculation, show that the Vanya states are localized on the orbitals or, okay, uh, or, you know, hybridized away from the orbital, but they're exponentially localized. But then that would be expensive if you wanted to do it for 70,000 materials, you couldn't do it. There's no way you can do it even with, you know, supercomputer. Um, but you don't need to do this, right? You can, there, there will be an overkill. You can, what you can do is again, just look at these, look at these bands. Um, check that the eigenvalues are are compatible with those in the atomic limit, and then and then um, um, look at how far they are, how the, the gap is. Then you can also look, you know, this geometric method that we have. Um, what's going on here? Okay, somehow uh, could I have annotate? I shouldn't have annotate. Sorry. Uh, sorry, one second. Let me just clear the annotation. Okay. Okay, very good. So these geometric methods that we have can detest, can detest, can detect, can detect the testable clusters. So for example, if I just have, you know, if we have cluster, a cluster of molecules, so if I have a cluster of molecules of atoms, a molecular cluster, okay? If this, and the lattice unit cell is large, but it's around another, okay? Then you're gonna get molecular. So this is large, this is much larger than this L1, much larger than L2, okay? So there's geometric ways also of identifying uh, a trivial, atomic band. So you first run the, you first find the flat band, you find its eigenvalues. If they're compatible with an atomic limit, you go further, you check the geometry of it, etc. So you can identify all the atomic limits. Okay. Very good. Another question is um, from Mikel. Could a procedure like this be Take a 2D material, find a Vanya type binding, and use the SMH construction to produce a bilayer or slat band as graphing based on lattice and positions of Vanya orbitals. Okay, so that's a good question. And the answer to this is anything is possible, but this would be remarkably hard. Okay. And, and the reason why it's remarkably hard is basically the reason why you can't predict more band structures really for anything else but these simple graphing cases. So, you know, for example, I wouldn't trust any more band structure of tungsten ditellurite, okay? A much more complicated system. So once you have a Fermi surface, once you start, once you have, you know, Fermi surfaces, okay, if you twist them, then, then you're gonna have a large, number of degrees of freedom coupling is not lying in twisted in bilayer where you couple the rock fermion to another rock fermion. And especially if you have many, uh, many firm surfaces in the original material, once you twist it, things will couple all, all over the place and you won't get something clean and I wouldn't trust it. Now, now, also it's not guaranteed that if you start with an exact flat band, once you twist them, 
uh, you're going to end up with a flat band. And the reason for that is, you know, the hopping between layers is also a border electron volts. Even graphene is point, I think, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, something like that, electron volts, in, so, uh, or 0.2, something like that. So, so you know, all any possibility that you'd get a bandwidth of that order could happen if you start with flat bands. So, so I wouldn't say that this is so far a fruitful um, um, path, although I would say that it would be very interesting if one could make it work, um, um, of course. Um, now, at the current state, I think you cannot predict basically um, accurately the behavior of twisted layers with the exception of some very simple ones. Uh, certainly for something as complicated as tungsten ditillary, which is, by the way, not very complicated from a DFT point of view. Um, not incredibly complicated. I mean, it's complicated, but not incredibly. Uh, not a huge amount of bands. I wouldn't trust any more event structure that's that's predicted. Um, so, yeah, so your question is that, your question is basically a whole research field that could be developed. Um, it's very hard. Okay. Among, uh, Chiara is asking, among the flat bands which are identified as flat atomic from the band representation, could, there, could they have non-trivial topology detective atomines? Um, yes. The answer is yes. And actually, the same. So, okay, so the question, which is again a very, very good question, is basically you have these eigenvalues. We, we have these eigenvalues of the flat band. Okay. And so far, I've mentioned only that, that the flat band, okay, so far, I've mentioned only that the flat band. Um, has some eigenvalues. What I didn't mention, and what's what's less looked at, but it's but but the fact that it works is in in the flat band construction paper, but it's not analyzed to the full extent. Is that this works also for systems where you don't have um, where you don't have um, eigenvalues, for example. So let's take a lattice like this, where you have no unitary symmetry, but you have C2T. Okay. Okay, so you have C2T, and here you have these, these things. Okay. And on this lattice, C2 the the you know C2 C2 times time reversal basically still fixes you some weak oppositions, okay? And this is a weak opposition. This is 1A, right? It's invariant under C2 and time reversal. This is 2B. This is 1A, actually 1A, I guess this is 1A, 1B, 2C. Anyways, there's some, okay? Uh, uh, with C4, I guess, also. Well, if I have C4 and C2, let's see. Let's not have, uh, okay, so let's not have, um, uh, C. Let's not have this. Let's have just okay. Let's have just. So we see two. There's. This is okay. This is one a. This is we see two and t. This is one b, and this is one c. Okay. Okay. Very good. Uh, those are the positions with with c two. If I put c four, I have the two c position. But if I put c Values, so I don't want to have eigenvalues. So C to T is an anti-unitary symmetry that doesn't have eigenvalues. Okay. Uh, okay. However, you know that um, um, basically your flat band will still be given by the band representation here. Okay, minus the band representation here. Okay, band representation of these two minus this band representation. Okay, and actually, what you know is that you'll have. We can go. We can go through this, but you can. You'll know that you'll have a a crossing point and a flat band, and because of C two T, whatever you do to this, you cannot gap the crossing point. 
Okay, so all this, so even among the band representation that can be identified as atomic limits from their eigenvalues, you can have you can have a topology based on non eigenvalues such as the C to T ones. So we give an example, and I forgot which one it is, where you have actually exactly the fragile topology of of the of the um, a twisted bilayer um, graphene um coming from a from a, a s matrix construction with only c to t okay so it is possible this formalism of band representations you know if you take differences of band representations is not just eigenvalues okay there's another thing which is the real space indicator which tells you if you can form a band representation from orbitals at some position or not and those work also in the case of, you know, anti-unitary symmetry, such as C2T. Um, um, you won't be able to know if, you know, there, if you have absolutely no symmetries. If you absolutely have no symmetries, then, then this won't work. But you could, you could have it, as you said, you could have something identifies a flat atomic uh, band structure from the eigenvalues but still be topological from Wilson loop. And the C2T case is the perfect example because you have no eigenvalues at high symmetry points. Very good question. Okay. So then there's how would the number of materials with flat bands, the number of materials with good, this Mikhail's question, how the number of materials with flat bands and the number of materials with good flat bands change if more sophisticated treatments of electron interactions like LDA, including the calculations of the database? Well, that's, 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 you know, obviously a, a good thing to, to try and to do, uh, but, you know, I don't know the answer of how it would change, right? That's a research, it's a research topic. I mean, a lot of them would magnetize. What we've computed is the paramagnetic um, uh, phase. A lot of them would magnetize. How many of them would magnetize? Um, only God and the person who's going to do the calculation know. Oscar has a question. <laughs> Andre, uh, so um, you show these examples of non-atomic uh, uh, stoichiometric materials with flat bands that were known not to be ferromagnetic. Um, or, or magnetic or, or, or uh, anti-ferromagnetic also oh i see okay um <clears throat> so for example the one on top left in this in this figure it, it seems that the flat band is fully occupied is, is that correct yeah so in this case so you're right so in this case you need to uh to dope it so you know kava's thinking of how to dope it but they wouldn't be, it's not clear they will stay flat after doping so so I see. so yeah so but, but for example, from the topological classification, you can also find when it's an enforced semi-metal. So in this case here, it's an, this, so this guy is telling you, this guy indeed, so this, this is linear combination of EBRs, which basically LC EBR is linear combination of EBRs, just, you know, a, a name to, uh, to, uh, to scratch, uh, yeah. Uh, but, but it basically means that it's a sum of atomic limits at the Fermi level. So if I fill all these bands, as you, as you said, it basically tells you that it's, it's a small gap insulator at the Fermi level if I fill all these bands. And it's, so I would need to dope a little bit into these, into these bands. But there are some of them, like this, this guy is also at the Fermi level. So if you see here in, in four semi-metal, this is at the Fermi level. Mm -hmm. And this guy uh, at the Fermi level, if you follow it, there's like, well, this guy is a metal, but because but it's a metal in the in the sense of like the band dipping in and out. It's actually in the topological sense, it's an insulator because you know it could be right. It could be it's a it's a metal in this in this in this sense. There's a direct you know, gap. Yeah. Right, right, right. Exactly, and it's a topological uh, metal. So this 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 tells you that it's a split. Anyways, and it's just another name, but this is a topological. So, so out of these ones, this one you write is it's a small gap trivial. So you need to dope it, uh, but these ones are at the Fermi level. I see. 
Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Okay, I think there are no more questions. You did a very good job. Um, so yeah, I think we can leave it here. I think uh, everybody's <laughs> flying out. <laughs> so uh, very good. Uh, thanks for the nice um, lectures. Um, and uh, yeah, we hope you show up every now and then for the others. And uh, then thank everyone for attending. And I think we can call it here for, for the day. And uh, please remember to check out the Slack channel. Also, thanks to Jen and <laughs> Ben Weider to because of uh, they're, they're like answering questions uh, live uh, and very very uh, in, in a, with a lot of detail so so I want to thank them here and uh, yeah so we'll thank all the speakers and see you tomorrow thank you bye yeah, bye bye bye